On behalf of the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory, also known as 3CT, I'd like to welcome you to a conference on the current global crisis and the study of economy and society. The ongoing global economic crisis poses a serious challenge to our understanding of large-scale social processes and hence of our own historical circumstances. As global capitalist society appears to be entering a new phase, it seems imperative to begin interrogating the relation of social and economic inquiry to changes in the large-scale configurations of society, economy, and polity. To this end, the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory has planned a series of conferences, of which this is the first, that aim to respond to the challenges posed by the current world economic crisis to dominant paradigms in the contemporary social sciences. Viewed retrospectively, there appears to be a relationship between the success of particular social scientific paradigms and their historical contexts. For example, Keynesian economics and the positivist development-oriented social sciences appeared most successful between the 1930s and 1970s, that is, during the epoch that began with the crisis of laissez-faire capitalism and ended with the crisis of state-centered economic configurations. Welfare state developmentalist paradigms were displaced during the 1970s by an updated neoclassical economics that went hand in hand with an emerging system of financialization, globalization, and deregulation. Concomitantly, the social sciences witnessed a turn away from the study of large structures and processes toward postmodern anti-foundationalism in some cases and the micro-foundations of social life in others. Dominant for the last three decades, these approaches now seem to have reached their limits, unable to grasp adequately our current moment of transformation. The shift away from the study of large-scale historical processes and structures is, we suggest, in part responsible for the difficulties the social sciences have had to delineate the contours of what has become a systemic global economic crisis. Moreover, the history of the social sciences in the past century suggests that paradigms of inquiry should be understood reflexively as modes of inquiry that are not independent of time and place. We hope that our multifaceted initiative will contribute to the process of reflection and re-examination in the social sciences and will help continue the University of Chicago's tradition of generating innovative fundamental approaches to the study of our social universe. I'd like to thank our many co-sponsors in the university, the Frankie Institute of the Humanities, the Norman Wade Harris Fund, the History Department, the Anthropology Department, the Nicholson Center for British Studies, the Social Sciences Division, the Department of Political Science, as well as the Divinity School. In addition, I'd especially like to thank Anwen Torme, the Assistant Director of 3CT, who has done an enormous amount of work organizing this conference. Thank you, Anwen. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that we are audio and video recording the conference. The video, hopefully, will be linked to our website in about two weeks' time. The panels are organized so that public questions and answers will follow presentations of the papers and the comment. For those who will have questions or comments, we ask you to form a line at the microphone at the appropriate time. Where, where is the mic going to be? Oh, it's right there. Okay, good. Uh, the first session, chaired by William Sewell, is scheduled to run until 12.30, after which we will take a one-hour break for lunch to be followed by a panel chaired by Lisa Boudin at 1.30. There will be a reception from 4 to 5 in the Commons Room downstairs. Thank you. <laughs>
Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Bill Sewell. Um, I teach uh, history and political science here at the University of Chicago, and I want to welcome you to our first session. Um, <clears throat> I'll be quite brief in my uh, introductory comments, and I'm going to introduce all of the uh, paper presenters um, and our commentator um, at the beginning, and then they'll just give their papers uh, so, uh, one after another. Um, our first paper will be by uh, David Harvey, who is a distinguished professor of anthropology at the City University of New York Graduate Center. Um, he was trained, as most of you probably know, as a geographer uh, and spent a long time as professor of geography at Johns Hopkins University with a brief stint at Oxford. Uh, he is the author of many books relevant to the subject. Um, the most recent is The Enigma of Capital, published just this year. Uh, I'd also mention A Brief History of Neoliberalism um, and uh, Two Oldies But Goodies, Condition of, the Condition of Postmodernity and Limits to Capital. Um, his talk will be entitled, Moving the Crisis Around from Economics to Politics and Back. Our second presenter is Duncan Foley, who is the Leo Modell Professor of Economics at the New School. I'm not sure which Adam this is, but I suspect it's not the biblical one. Um, he's also uh, published uh, dozens of articles in economics journals, some of them uh, highly mathematical in character. Um, his topic will be uh, the political economy of post-crisis global capitalism. The third presenter is uh, Beverly Silver, who is professor of sociology at Johns Hopkins University. She is the author of Forces of Labor, uh, Workers' Movements, and Globalization Since 1970, and the co-author with uh, Giovanni Arrighi of Chaos and Governance in the Modern World System. Uh, her paper today is uh, co-authored with her frequent collaborator, uh, the late Giovanni Arrighi, who, uh, a great pity for all of us in this business, uh, died a little over a year ago. <clears throat> uh, the paper is entitled Crisis of Capital, Crisis of Labor, a Global View from the End of the American Century. Uh, the final paper is by Emmanuel Wallerstein, who is currently Senior Research Scholar at Yale University. Uh, previous to that, for a long time, he was a Distinguished Professor of Sociology at Binghamton University uh, and the head of the Fernand Brodel Center, which was the real uh, kind of global center of world systems uh, research. Uh, he is the author of many, many books. Um, I'll mention just one, that is The Modern World System, uh, which is in three volumes, but with a fourth volume uh, promised for May of next year. Um, his topic will be Structural Crisis in the World System. Where do we go from here? <clears throat> David Harvey. Um, I've just had to write an afterword to uh, the paperback edition of the Enigma of Capital, and it's uh, sort of interesting uh, to reflect on how things have changed uh, since the original text was written about a year and a couple of months ago. Um, one of the themes of Enigma is the idea that crises get shifted around. They get shifted around geographically and they get shifted around systemically. And there's been a good deal of shifting which has gone on over the past year, and I wanted to pay a little bit of attention to the nature of those shifts. Um, I think that the beginning point for this would be to just look geographically at how a crisis which originated in housing markets in southwest of the United States and the American South, Florida in particular, uh, hit international institutions and then spread around the world with the collapse of Lehman Brothers, went global, and a curious kind of habit of just popping up in surprising places, like when I just managed to squeeze into the original Enigma book, a uh, comment about Dubai World going belly up, 
but you never knew where the crisis was going to hit next. And then, of course, the next thing, it's Greece, and now it's Ireland, and you don't know where it's going to go. Um, but one of the things that struck me, however, about this uh, moving geographical crisis was that for many parts of the world, uh, the crisis is at actually long gone. Uh, it's no longer really a relevant topic of conversation. Um, and even in this country, of course, the recession was declared to be over as of June 2009. So why are we talking about a crisis when actually, even in this country, officially, we're out of it? And we're left with a, a kind of a, a sense, a very different sense, and as I travel around the world, um, in Argentina, for example, I mean, you know, Argentina has a political crisis about once every three weeks, you know, so... But economic crisis, they say, what economic crisis? You know, they're growing around 7 or 8 percent. They're doing very well. Brazil is doing very well. Uh, Australia is doing fine. Chile is doing fine. Uh, so, economically, it seems, there's not so big a problem except that in North America and in Europe there is this kind of overwhelming sense that there's something really, really wrong. And the really, really wrong turns out to be the employment situation. Uh, but when you start to look at the employment data, there was a fascinating uh, IMF-ILO joint report that came out last September which talked about uh, the unemployment situation. And what they did was to talk about the net loss of jobs 2007, 2009, and you look at the pattern and it's really fascinating. Uh, what they suggested was that the net loss of jobs worldwide was around 30 million. Uh, of the 20 million that you can sort of statistically account for, there was a high, high concentration of job losses in the United States. Uh, that actually 7.5 million uh, net job losses in the United States. Uh, and the pattern in the emerging markets was rather different. Uh, there were not so many serious job losses. The biggest one was China of only 3 million, which given the size of the Chinese labor market is difficult but not, uh, not impossible. And then you start to look at uh, the European situation and you see these remarkable differences between an unemployment rate in Spain of near 20%, uh, 4% in the Netherlands, and Germany doing rather well, and the pigs doing terribly badly, and, and so there are these uneven impacts of unemployment. And one of the things that comes out of this is the tremendous concentration of the loss of job losses inside of the United States itself. And here there is therefore a sense of crisis around that and what to do about it and how that crisis might be uh, attacked and, and, and discussed. Now, so the geographical situation is that. But in exactly the same way that most of the American public didn't care at all when 15 million people lost their jobs in Indonesia in 1997-98, uh, when you go to Argentina or you go to China or something like that, they don't care about the problems we have here. I mean, they basically say it's your problem, not ours. In the same way, when we looked at Indonesia back then, they said, well, it's their problem, not ours. So there's a certain geographical myopia here, and we're concentrating on the crisis because we're feeling it here in ways which is not felt in much of the rest of the world. And I think we have to get that very firmly in our heads when we start to talk about our crisis is a global crisis. It's a bit like, you know, declaring, uh, you know, the baseball is a World Series when it's, you know, <laughs> same sort of same sort of logic uh, that, that behind it. So, so we have to keep that in mind. But in this country. The, 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 the special nature of this is that in the, the preceding two recessions in 1991-92 and 2001-2 uh, were followed by what's called jobless recoveries. Uh, the problem this time is it's not a jobless recovery, it's a joblessness creating recovery. I mean, today the uh, unemployment rate went up a couple of percentage points. Uh, and we're supposed to be long out of the recession, but the unemployment situation is still there. So this then raises, uh, I think, a whole set of uh, interesting kind of questions as to how to factor in what is going on in this country versus what is going on globally and to see what some of the connections might be. Uh, now, one of the things that immediately uh, strikes me is that whereas after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, when the G20 first got together, 
Uh, there was certain kind of uh, economic necessity that led to all sorts of things, like the bailouts and the operation of the Federal Reserve to bail out not only the U.S. system but uh, pretty much everybody else, and 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 the collective attempt uh, to do something. The G20, the, the 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 coalition, if you like, that that came together around the economic emergency of the time has fractured very much politically. And so, for me, one of the interesting questions is how the crisis has moved, if you like, from the economic dimension of absolute necessity of doing something, you know, getting the, the, the financial system back into shape, uh, to a set of political choices. And it seems to me that there are radically different political choices being made. And therefore, we have to look at the pattern of political choices in this country, and particularly or, or, and, and alongside Europe. And you see a different pattern emerging there to what's going on in the rest of the world. Briefly kind of put, you can divide the world into two halves. One is caught up with this deficit reduction austerity kind of nonsense, and the other half is being straight Keynesian and, 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 and expansionary, uh, which is based, of course, in China, but also in India and all the rest of it. And of course, China's been growing, it dipped down to around 6% growth in the worst of the crisis, lost a lot of jobs for a bit. Now it's back up way above 10%. And, and India is about to sort of chase it uh, even, even, even further. And anybody who's connected to the Chinese uh, uh, growth uh, boom is, is doing pretty well. Uh, that accounts for much of Latin America. I mean, much of Latin America is doing well because it's been turned into one vast soybean plantation with, with actually pretty devastating uh, environmental consequences in the long run, but on the other hand, uh, they're doing extremely well economically precisely because of the connectivity to the China trade. In fact, uh, uh, the trade with China has, has, has increased tenfold over the last ten years, and so there's a reorientation going on uh, of, of, of this sort in, in, in the global economy. Which then brings us, if you like, to the kind of question as to why the political choice uh, in, this, in this country and, uh, particular, and also in Europe uh, towards the politics of deficit reduction and austerity in the face of actually most economists who have any kind of brains in their head would kind of say that's, that's exactly the wrong thing to do. And this is, of course, is being followed by Cameron in Britain. And Cameron's recipe for the difficulties in Britain, which uh, was a very high concentration of, of the unemployment too, is to do deficit reduction, which is going to reduce public sector employment by nearly half a million, but also reduce the flow of good flow of, of uh, uh, monies into municipal municipalities and the like in such a way that the subcontractors are going to be hit. So the estimates are that actually the Cameron's politics are going to lead to an increase in unemployment of something like, like 1.6 million people. Now, why does that make sense in a situation where there's a serious... And the answer is, well, once you get all of that out of the way, once you've done all of that, then private investment's going to come in and pick up the slack. But if you look at the data on private investment in Britain, it's never been that, that, that strong in, in job creation. And what you're looking at is a situation where you're going to get rid of something like 1.5 million, 6 million uh, jobs over the next three or four years and, and probably make up uh, 500, you know, about, about a quarter of that in terms of private sector employment. So why on earth would you make that choice? Well, the answer here is, I think, uh, something that I know that uh, Beverly will talk about and talks about it uh, very, uh, very seriously which is that capital has been engaged in a long-term fight to unload the costs of social reproduction and also unload the costs of environmental de degradation. This is what the whole neoliberal project was, was really all about, uh, was to try to get rid of all of those costs and say you're on your own as far as your health care, your education, all this kind of... We don't want to have to bear any of the costs. Now, during the 1950s, 1960s, capital was forced to bear some of those costs, either through, you know... The, the, the sort of public, the, the corporate pension plans and health care plans and all the rest of it, uh, or through state interventions in the sort of social democratic model in, in Europe. But since the 1970s, there's been a frontal attack upon that, but there's still a lot of stuff left, like social security and all the rest of it. And one of the tactics of the right in this has been, uh, to, you know, which is well funded, of course, by, by corporate capital, one of the tactics of the, of, of, of the right is to use the deficit as an, as an excuse, and I was very struck by a very simple parallel. Uh, Reagan uh, reduced tax rates dramatically from around 70% in the top bracket to around 30%. He did that. Second thing he did was he, he engaged in an arms race with, uh, with the Soviet Union. 
And the result of that was that Reagan built up huge, huge deficits. And Stockman, David Stockman, his budget director, said our plan was to increase the deficits and increase the debt to such a level that then we could attack all the social programs. This is what we were really after, was to use it that way. Now, what did Bush do? He cut taxes, he, two unfunded wars, and of course he then gave a big gift to Big Pharma through the Medicare prescription drug program, created a huge deficit, and what, what's now the right-wing thing is to say the deficit leads to the idea we're going to attack the living standards of the mass of the population. Now, this has been a theme which has been very important to me about trying to understand what the neoliberal project was all about politically. Uh, back in New York City fiscal crisis, back in the Mexican debt crisis of 1982, what was done was Mexicans are in debt. They're likely to default. What happens? The U.S. Treasury and the IMF buy, bails them out so they can pay off the New York bankers. And eventually, that, 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 is, that is what happened. But they pay them off by reducing the standard of living of the Mexican population by about 25%. And this became standard IMF practice. And now we're going through, in this country, standard IMF practice. And people in Brazil laugh and kind of say, hey, boy, now you know what it's like, you know. Uh, enjoy it. We, we had it three times in you know, three decades. So, you know, now you enjoy it. And, and so, so this is happening. But why exactly is, 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 is this happening? Well, it has a lot to do, of course, with uh, 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 the waging of a certain kind of class war. And I love the kind of comment that Warren Buffett made, who kind of said, of course there's class war. And it's my class, the rich class, that are, that are, that are making it. And we're winning. And that is exactly, it seems to me, what it's been about all along. It's about actually a plutocratic uh, politics of trying to actually create more and more wealth in smaller classes, and we're seeing this going on right now in Congress over this business of you know, the extension of the Bush tax cuts. So this is the politics of it. And the irony is, of course, in the same way that, uh, in a way, kind of neoliberalism got completed by Clinton and by, by, uh, by Tony Blair, so we're now seeing another stage of it, if you like, which is flowing into the present, which is another attack upon the standards of living of the mass of the population and the bailing out of capital from any concerns about social reproduction and, if possible, of course, any concerns about dealing with environmental degradation. But this, this, so this story is being picked up in Europe. I mean, it's not as if Cameron created the deficit in Britain at all. But, of course, a lot of the deficit comes out of the reduction of revenues. And the reduction of revenues come from the lack of employment. And so one of the ways in which you could actually reduce the deficit is that's to increase employment. But that's exactly the opposite way in which things, things are going. So here's this picture which is emerging of, of what the political choice is in the face of the kinds of difficulties which exist. That, that is, the deficit is being used. The debt is being used uh, for a very political purpose. And we have to see this as a political, not an economic choice, because there are other economic choices. And those other economic choices are, I think, represented by exactly what it is that China's been doing. China was faced with a downturn of its export market. So what did it do? It had, had a huge kind of uh, infrastructural investment program, $600 billion, nearly as big as the US stimulus program. And they basically were about trying to unite the country, much as happened in this country in 1950s and 1960s, make the spatial economy of China into a kind of a unity by linking the interior with the, with the coastline, coast and all the rest of it, building new cities, building new kind of highways, building high street networks and so on. I mean, this is a, this is a highly targeted infrastructural development program which should uh, improve Chinese productivity very significantly as opposed to the kind of you know, stimulus programs we have in this country that don't seem to add very much to, to national productivity. So there's that part. The other part was to tell the banks, and of course if you're a Chinese banker you don't have an option of saying to the uh, central government, bug off, you can't do that. So basically you do what they, and they say, can't, lend to people, lend to people. So they're lending like crazy, and there's an emergence also in China of an, un, uh, an unregulated banking system, a bit like occurred in this country. And the result is, in, 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 in China, in many ways they're doing exactly the same thing as happened here in the 2000s which is that they're starting to put money into all kinds of kind of crazy local kind of projects. And so we're getting an asset bubble in China, 
in Shanghai, the property market uh, actually doubled in, 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 in prices last year, and there was apparently a, a nationwide increase of property uh, prices of about 10 to 15 percent uh, last year. So you're getting an asset bubble as well. Now, a lot of things going on in China along this line, but the place is booming. And as it booms, of course, the demand for raw materials is becoming very significant. I mentioned Latin America, but copper in Chile, Australia, which provides a lot of raw materials, booming along with, with, with them. And, and at the same time, the Chinese have also either been forced to or decided to uh, actually permit another aspect of the Keynesian program, which is the, 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 the empowerment of, of a working class in terms of wages. And there was all this stuff with Toyota, Honda, Foxconn last year, and, and wages have increased in the Pearl River Delta by about 20% in just this last year, which starts to see a substitution of the internal market for the export market. So you start to see, actually, the elements of de facto a, a huge kind of uh, uh, Keynesian program, but as always happens with Keynesian programs, there's a downside. The, the inflation rate in China is going up. There are all sorts of instabilities uh, within this kind of program, and so one of the big question marks is how far this China developmental model can go, how much can it entrain with it in terms of the rest of the, the world's economy, and will we, if we're around this time next year and we come back here, will we be talking about the, the, the crash of the Chinese model, which is very, very possible in the next four or five years that we will see something of that sort as, as you know, the, the Keynesian model becomes difficult when you refuse to, to, to actually curb it in a su sufficient way. Now, the Chinese are trying to curb it a little bit, and it's very interesting to see how global stock markets react to that. The Chinese kind of say, well, we're going to actually try and curb lending, and the global stock markets go down. Uh, yesterday, the, an index of, uh, of manufacturing activity in China went up more than expected. The stock markets boomed. So actually, the whole global thing is now sort of sticking around with this sort of, this sort of thing. Now, internally, the comparison with internally in this country, I mean, again, what is amazing about this country is that actually the level of unemployment is, of course, adding to wage repression. And there's absolutely no way in which you can push wage repression uh, further than it, it really is, is already being pushed, but I don't know if you've noticed, but profit rates uh, actually are booming in this country. In other words, the crisis was over in June of 2009 for capital, and it continues to be over for capital. In fact, in fact the, 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 the volume of profits now is back to where it was way, way before the crash. And, and, but that profitability is largely being constructed out of further wage repression. So you have the introduction of this two-tier wage system now where, you know, the older people can stick with their wage bargain, but the newer people coming in have to come in at half a wage rate and, 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 and no kind of and no, no level of sort of social provision. So that is going on in this country. So you see this, that going on in this country, and you see this opposite going on in this other part of the world. And I think what we have to do is to recognize that what's happening in this country is a political choice. But it's a political choice which does not make sense in terms of the revival of any kind of economic growth. And from that standpoint, actually, it was seen to be a correct political choice in relationship to one of the other issues that I raised in the enigma of capital, which is the incapacity uh, of any economy to continue to grow at 3% compound rate forever. That we are at a point where 3% compound growth minimum, and it's always a minimum, is not on the, on, not on the cards. And so, at some point or other, there is having to be some sort of retrenchment in terms of the growth syndrome. But China is not going that way at all. We're going it, but we're not going it for those kinds of reasons which are about trying to find a way to deal uh, with the restraints which exist on 3% compound growth forever. We're not doing it for that any reason. We're doing it for plutocratic, uh, it's, a, it's a form of plutocratic politics that we're engaging in right now. And I think we should be prepared to call it that. And so this then leads into, if you like, the whole kind of question of, well, in terms of, of capital accumulation, uh, what we see is a situation in this country in particular where individual capitalists operating in their own self-interest are not likely to behave in a way which has anything to do with the rep replication of, of a dynamic capitalist system. And that applies to factions too. I mean, we have factions of bankers, we have factions of, of the rentiers, and we have factions... Uh, of, the, of the merchant capitalists well, like Walmart and all the rest of it. So those factions are pulling the, if you like, pulling the whole thing apart. So there's a lack of coherence, even in terms of the capitalist class positionality in this country, 
in relationship to kind of reconstruct a capitalist system that is able to work. And in a sense, what we're seeing is, if you like, the destruction of, of a, a, a traditional kind of capitalist system by the behavior of the capitalists themselves. Now, in the past, they've often done that, but they've been prevented very often by large social movements that have prevented them from doing an apres moi le deluge kind of politics. And what we're into right now on the part of the capitalist class is an apres moi le deluge politics. And as far as they're concerned, they don't really care as long as they can prepare their arcs to float off all over the place. And one of the ways in which they're doing that, by the way, is to command resources. The land grab going on around the world is absolutely phenomenal right now. The grabbing of land in Africa, Latin America, uh, what parts of South Asia and resources and all the rest of it. So there's a political process going on, and we have to pay attention to the politics because the politics are going to have economic consequences. And we're, as the economic consequences unfold, we find ourselves probably back in another form of economic crisis in a year or two, uh, which is out, if you like, going to lead from, this is my, my theme, is going to lead us back from taking purely political solutions to having to actually address serious economic issues. And behind that politics, I think, lies what seems to me to be the imperative. Yeah, I think, I think uh, Buffett is right. They are waging class war. They've been waging class war for the last 30, 40 years. And yes, they have been winning. But then the big question is, how are we going to stop them winning? I mean, that's our political question. And if we can't stop them winning, they are likely to destroy their own system. So one thing we can do is to help them preserve their system, but then we've got to go beyond that to talk about an organized transition to something called socialism, whatever, communism, whatever you want to call it, an alternative to the capitalist dynamic. Thanks very much. I've had the good fortune to be on several panels of this kind with David Harvey, and I've, I've learned from that two things. One is that I always uh, enjoy it because I learn a lot of uh, information and points of view that I had not uh, thought about before. And second, I, I hate it because he usually goes first, and he <laughs> says many of the things that I had planned to, uh, to focus on, and, um, but that is um, fine with me, too. Um, I uh, sat down uh, to try to write down some thoughts about the, uh, political, uh, the political economy of world capitalism um, and discovered that it takes a little more than 20 minutes for me to um, explore all of these aspects. But I thought in the, in the talk I would... Um, I would try to highlight three, three questions. First of all, to talk a little bit about the relation of this crisis to Marxian crisis theory, crisis theories, um, because that's kind of the background of the way that I tend to think about uh, these issues analytically. Um, secondly, I'd like to discuss a little bit um, uh, the political economy of the last uh, 30 or 40 years in terms of macroeconomics and particularly macroeconomic policy and um, mainstream economic analysis. And then uh, I hope um, I won't use up too much of my time and uh, can spend the last part of the talk just throwing out on the table, really, for discussion four uh, questions uh, about the future, uh, which have to do with um, where uh, the world uh, political economic system um, goes from here um, uh, in terms especially of the U.S. position in the world political economic system. Um, to begin with the Marxian uh, crisis theory, um, if you're interested in this uh, uh, in more technical detail, this is I go over this in chapter three of my book, Adam's Fallacy, which is about Marx. Um, there are really two phases of Marx's, um, I believe, my reading of Marx, uh, is that there are two phases of his thinking about the contradictions of macroeconomic contradictions of capitalism, um, which correspond to two uh, different ideas about what can go wrong. One, one phase one might call uh, a law of increasing rate of exploitation or increasing surplus value, which um, in, came up in Marx's thinking um, at an early stage when he was trying to link together Adam Smith's view that uh, 
the extension of the division of labor under capitalism would increase labor productivity with Malthus and Ricardo's view that uh, capitalism t would tend to push wages down to a low subsistence uh, level. And under those circumstances, you obviously get an ever-growing gap between what labor can produce or what it is producing and the uh, equivalent that it gets back in terms of the wage. Um, and that pattern um, has its own uh, typical and characteristic uh, macroeconomic difficulties. In particular, it has the difficulty of maintaining aggregate demand because uh, while workers are pretty reliable spenders and tend uh, to turn over wages back into co commodity purchases very regularly, this huge growing surplus value uh, in this pattern um, is much harder to find an outlet for since capitalist consumption, no matter how heroically people put on um, buy bigger yachts and uh, bigger estates and so forth, um, uh, it inevitably uh, tends to fall short of the, of the potential. Um, then in the 1850s, uh, in terms of Marx's bi the biography, the, um, the, it became clear that in Britain and much of Europe, capitalism was changing that pattern um, to a pattern where wages started to grow. Exactly why wages started to grow in that period is not uh, completely uh, transparent to me, but there's no doubt that it tended to happen. And uh, for a long time, maybe 120 years, uh, there was a different pattern of accumulation in which the rate of exploitation tended to be roughly speaking constant. That is, wages tended to grow at about the same rate as uh, labor productivity, not exactly by any means, but roughly speaking, keeping um, keeping pace. Um, and that uh, pattern um, led Marx to write the um, chapters of Volume 3 of Capital, what's published now is Volume 3 of Capital, on the theory of the falling rate of profit, which develops a, an alternative understanding of what uh, the dynamics of capital accumulation are, which is that rising wages are a strong incentive for capitalists to raise labor productivity by finding uh, technological innovations and, and widening the social division of labor um, and that under those circumstances the big problem is the possibility that the uh, increased organic composition of capital that's required to sustain these higher productivity technologies uh, will lower the profit rate even though the rate of surplus value may not go uh, down uh, or in fact might go up a little bit. So that's the falling rate of profit um, uh, story in a, in a very brief nutshell. One important thing about this falling rate of profit story is that it's one of these unintended consequences um, uh, situations where capitalists find themselves actually doing something that's probably good for the society as a whole. That is the pattern of, the pattern of accumulation and technical progress on in the long run tends to raise labor productivity, increase, develop the forces of production in uh, Marxian terms, um, and in that sense um, allow at least the possibility of more of a, of a better life for uh, human beings. Um, it's the framework that I'm working in um, works on the hypothesis that of the four great crises of the last 150 years, which is the um, depression of the 1890s, well, in the, particularly in the United States, the Great Depression of the 1930s, the stagflation crisis of the 1970s, and this most recent um, crisis of 2007-2008, that of those four, two were falling rate of profit crises, and two were rising rate of exploitation crises. The two that were falling rate of profit crises were the 1890s and the 1970s, and the two which were the rising rate of exploitation crises were the Great Depression and the current uh, world uh, situation. And it's instructed to think about it this way because although um, both falling rate of profit crises and rising rate of exploitation crises can give, can have the symptoms of inadequate aggregate demand, 
they actually have a very different flavor to them. Uh, falling rate of profit crises uh, tend always to be about upward pressure on wages. Um, and therefore, they tend to be in modern monetary systems inflationary crises, cost push, crises of cost push inflation. Um, increasing rate of exploitation crises, on the other hand, have to do, as David um, pointed out, with a falling uh, wage or falling real wage, or at least a real wage that's not growing as fast as uh, labor productivity. Um, and therefore, they tend to have um, the macroeconomic problems of stagnation of aggregate demand, chronic deflationary pressure uh, rather than inflationary pressure. And I believe that's basically where we are in the world um, system. Let me move on for a moment to looking at the interpretation of um, economics and economic, political economy um, over the past uh, 40 years, since about 1970, uh, let's say. Um, there's a, um, the point of view of mainstream economics is rather instructive in this um, regard and is maybe not such a bad starting place to get some perspective on this. Um, Thomas Sargent, in his um, presidential address to the American Economics Association, I think it was in January 2007, perhaps, ill-timed. Ill um, uh, I mean, an unfortunate moment to uh, have to uh, give a sort of summary statement. Um, uh, argued, uh, gave the following kind of story, His, and it's, it's a completely a, a, a story about the technical problems of economics and mathematical economics and macroeconomics. His story was that there was a wrong theory. Wrong theory had its grip on uh, economists and on economic policymakers. That wrong theory was basically the Keynesian economics that David uh, was referring to. Um, including the idea that there was some kind of a trade-off between unemployment and aggregate demand. And that wrong theory led policymakers to terrible mistakes, which led to the stagflation problems of the 1970s. And it was only when economic theorists, like Sargent himself, Robert Lucas, um, Ned Phelps, uh, realized that there was a natural rate of unemployment um, and that uh, monetary policy really was powerless in any practical sense to influence uh, the real uh, level of economic activity, that um, both economic policy and uh, economic teaching were straightened out to the right theory, which effectively is a, uh, an application of Valrhasian general equilibrium theory in a very uh, simplified form to macroeconomic uh, problems. There's something to be said for this view, um, but uh, and in this occasion, what I'd like to underline is its blindness to what I think are very important uh, political economic aspects of this same story. So if I were going to tell this story, in fact, I am going to tell it, um, uh, if, when I get to tell the story, what I want to tell is the story that in the 1970s, you had a situation of chronic uh, upward pressure on wages in the advanced capitalist countries. Um, and that upward pressure on wages, as Keynes pointed out, had to take the form of upward pressure on money wages. And therefore, it looked to um, central banks like a uh, cost push inflation. And it posed a terrible dilemma for the central banks of that time which was that either they could expand uh, reserves and the money supply in order to accommodate these inflationary pressures, in which case you got uh, an inflation, or you could try to repress it by uh, going to tighter monetary policy, in which case you got a kind of stagnation of aggregate demand. And it, I, my understanding of the stagflation of that period is that it's much more closely uh, related to direct economic class struggle uh, over uh, wages and the wage share. Globalization and financialization were not, in, I think um, it would be um, giving too much credit to the policymakers who followed these roads to say that they had figured out that they would be a solution to this problem. 
But again, in the line of unintended consequences, it turned out that globalization was a terrific solution to this problem because the growing threat of job loss and the movement of productive facilities from high wage uh, to lower wage areas of the world managed to stop the growth of wages um, pretty much in its tracks starting in 1975 uh, to 1980. So curiously enough, this last 30, 25, 30 years have been a period uh, not of a trajectory a la Marx along the lines of the falling rate of profit analysis, but a trajectory in which the form of investment and capital accumulation to reduce costs has taken uh, the, the, um, the process of investment to reduce costs, has taken the form of relocating uh, existing productive facilities and existing technologies, not in substituting new ones uh, that raise uh, the productivity of labor um, uh, overall. And uh, this has been brilliantly successful from many points of view, and, and David has talked about many of the what I view as the consequences of this. Um, it's led to um, the global capitalism becoming a huge engine of surplus value creation. The trouble with surplus value creation is that it gets you into these high rate of exploitation difficulties, particularly two difficulties. One is the maintenance of aggregate demand because you have the problem of how do you recycle these big amounts of surplus value into productive investment um, uh, on, a, on a world scale. And the second is that it puts tremendous pressure on financial systems because it's precisely financial intermediation that has the function in a capitalist society of transforming uh, profits which come in the form of money, which is, as Keynes pointed out, a very attractive asset since um, you, it can do anything. And that, that has to somehow be transformed into much riskier um, s fixed investments, uh, long-term investments, uh, which people don't want to hold. In fact, Keynes thought it was something of a miracle that the system would ever work at all because he didn't see how, uh, at least in his gloomier moments, he didn't see how you'd ever persuade people to give up money um, for, fixed, uh, for fixed investments. And it's um, pretty clear to me that, the, that from a structural point of view, aside from the dramatic bubbles and um, instabilities, um, but from a structural point of view, this was the shadow that was hanging over globalization um, starting from 2000 on and set the stage for the crisis of 2007-2008. Hey, let me take a couple of minutes to look at um, four issues for the future. Um, the first is this problem of global accumulation. What's going to be the pattern of global accumulation? Well, actually, as, as I say is so often the case, David has kind of covered this very well um, the, uh, from two points of view. First, it's really important to realize that this is not a world crisis in terms of capital accumulation. In fact, it's not even clear to me it ever was exactly a world crisis. Um, it, uh, uh, it, and uh, parallel to the 1930s, the 1930s, for example, were a very, very good decade for most Latin American economies, um, despite the fact they were a terrible decade for British and American and some European uh, economies. Um, the second point is that this, this creates the presumption that one big problem that we have here is not just the total amount of aggregate, aggregate demand in the world economy, but its distribution. Um, and that aggregate demand policies that uh, uh, might lead to an uh, uh, acceptable average level of aggregate demand are uh, inflationary in some parts of the world and, and deflationary in other parts of the world and that nobody has any very good uh, idea of how to solve that problem. In particular, it's a problem because of the floating exchange rate system, which is part and parcel of neoliberal financialization. 
The floating exchange rate system was supposed to restore autonomy of macroeconomic policy to individual countries. The, in theory, um, I remember hearing Milton Friedman explain this uh, very eloquently in talks in the 1980s. In theory, the floating exchange rate system would allow each country to run whatever macroeconomic policy it wanted, and the floating exchange rates would take up the slack of differential rates of inflation um, or deflation um, in, in countries with smoothly and, and efficiently. Um, as another, I guess, unintended consequence, the floating exchange rate system, however, is being, now is being used um, especially by emerging markets economies, especially in Asia, and China might be the most um, uh, salient uh, example, um, to uh, maintain their a bigger share of world aggregate demand than they could otherwise get. So they do that by um, maintaining low values, or if you like, undervalued currencies, uh, and accumulating uh, reserves. And the problem with that, which is a third point, is that that leads to the dollar dilemma. And that is something that is behind uh, some of the peculiar problems of the United States in this, um, in this moment. The dollar dilemma is that we worked very hard after the Second World War and um, uh, spent a lot of diplomatic and political international capital maintaining a system where the dollar is the world currency. And the US basically functions as the central bank and regulator of world aggregate demand. Well, that gave us tremendous powers in a lot of ways. It gave the US tremendous privileges, for example, to fund uh, imperial wars without uh, as much of a budget constraint as uh, would otherwise be the case. But in, a, in one of the Hegelian turns of history, um, it's now come back to haunt us because exactly that set of institutional arrangements means that the US is the one country in the world which cannot control its own exchange rate. The effective exchange rate of the dollar is basically determined by the uh, policies of all of the other countries in the world which are value their currencies in relation to the dollar. And so you see, um, predictably under these circumstances, um, a, a kind of a competitive devaluation situation uh, emerging in the, in the world um, economy. Um, are we going to solve that by the US, so the U.S. is in the curious position that it's the hegemonic economic power, but it cannot create the right amount of world aggregate demand, or at least it cannot create the right amount of world aggregate demand and provide enough aggregate demand to absorb uh, our own uh, excess unemployment, as which David so eloquently um, uh, painted uh, in, in his talk. So the final question, which as I say, I just throw out on the table and I'd be particularly interested in this, in this august assembly and what uh, people are thinking about this, is the question of US hegemony in larger terms. Um, David uh, subtitled his talk, um, or I guess the title is From Politics to Economics and Back or something. So I'm gonna do it, um, I'm gonna go to politics now. Um, the, uh, the world functioned with the U.S. not only as a hegemonic uh, financial power, but that was complementary to other roles that the U.S. played in dip diplomacy and particularly economic diplomacy. Um, from a Marxist point of view, I would say the um, striking thing about the post-Second World War period was that it avoided the internecine capitalist rivalries which pretty much blew the international capitalist system up in the First World War crisis, in the First World War crisis. And that seems to be one aspect of U.S. hegemony, that US, the U.S. is the leviathan, as it were, that uh, cracks the whip uh, over uh, the various pieces of the world capitalist system. Now, a question is, Two questions arise. Um, Charlie Kindleberger uh, raised this question very often. Um, uh, 
can you operate a world economic system without a hegemonic power? Um, Kindleberger pointed out that it never happened, that the fantasy that the gold standard was a self, completely self-regulating uh, system completely ignored the real fact that the, Sterling, that the Bank of England operated it as a sterling standard, not as just a gold standard, and uh, used uh, forms of discretionary monetary policy to stabilize uh, the system in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, in the 1930s, where, there, where the US refused to take on the role of world hegemonic leadership, the whole thing was a mess, and it fell apart almost completely as an actual uh, world system. So Kindleberg said, well, somebody's got to do it, so who's going to do it? Um, so that's the first question. Do we need a world hegemonic power? And the second is, is it going to be the United States, or somebody, if we do need one, is it going to be the United States or somebody else? And if it's going to be somebody else, who might um, that be? I personally, um, despite the uh, resourcefulness and um, I hate to use the word opportunism in this context, but that's sort of of the Chinese political leadership, um, I, um, am, I wonder whether they represent a tradition of understanding of these problems which would allow them to function as a world hegemonic um, uh, power. And in fact, they're still too small. Their economy is too small, and they're not uh, rich enough um, to do that. So having thrown out those questions, I will yield to Beverly. Thank you. I have a few. Let me just make sure this is going to work. It is going to work. OK. Um, now, it's interesting because uh, when Duncan got up, he said that. Uh, Mike, get closer to the mic. Oh, OK. Move it over. How's that, is that better? Yeah. Yeah, when, when Duncan got up, he said that David had uh, covered many of the themes and specificities that he was planning to talk about, and so then it's not surprising when I get up that I say that there are a lot of resonances between both David um, and Duncan's presentations and uh, what I plan to talk about today. But um, what I'm going to do is um, sort of falls into two parts. Um, one is trying to understand the present in a Braudelian long durée perspective of uh, several centuries or systemic cycles of accumulation going back to the 15th century. And the other is uh, understanding the present in a more Schumpeterian uh, short-term perspective uh, with Schumpeter saying that in these matters, 100 years is a short term. So we'll do a uh, 100 year perspective and a long durée perspective. Um, now, from the long durée perspective, um, it, I find it useful to think of the present as the end of the long 20th century, as the end of the American century, as the end of the systemic cycle of accumulation uh, that began in the late 19th century, centered in the United States, reached its full flowering during the golden age of Keynesianism, Fordism in the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s, and then entered crisis in the 70s, and uh, the, essentially a multifaceted and phased crisis, um, which I'll come back to in my more short-term discussion, but it, it uh, parallels some of the things Duncan and David were both saying about uh, the crisis of 70s starting out, the crisis in the 1970s starting out as a crisis, essentially a squeeze on profits, um, and then turning into an underconsumption type crisis. So, um, so uh, actually, let me 
pull this thing up now. I never know how to make this thing go. Do I need to make it go, or can I just F5? Actually, tiny print. Okay. So um, this is actually uh, a reworking of a figure by Gerhard Mensch from uh, the first chapter of Ariki's long 20th century, but I find it useful in terms of uh, thinking about the present and historical capitalism, seeing the history of uh, capitalism since its initial beginnings in the uh, Italian, centered in the Italian city-states in the 15th century as being a series of overlapping uh, systemic cycles of accumulation of overlapping S-curves with the uh, growing part in the S-curve uh, corresponding to the, um, uh, what would be the, considered the golden ages, you know, the golden ages of the industrial, of, of Britain as workshop of the world, the golden age of Keynesian um, uh, Fordism, et cetera. And the period between um, A and B as being the initial crisis of that systemic cycle of accumulation uh, and B, the terminal crisis of that systemic cycle of accumulation. So if we're thinking about today uh, and what I've already hinted at, that sometime in the 1970s, the stagflation of the 70s, which very importantly was also a major uh, period of crisis of US political power on a world scale, um, that we enter uh, an initial crisis of the uh, US-led systemic cycle of accumulation, um, which appears to lead to a major rebirth of US power on a world scale. But by 2000, certainly 2008, I mean, if we look at 2000, 2001 is the bursting of the internet stock market bubble. 2003 is the um, throwing in the, the idea that uh, the U.S. could use its military power to reestablish uh, global dominance um, through the invasion of Iraq, so the failure of the project for a new American century, and then finally the 2008 financial crisis. Somewhere between that, the bursting of the internet stock market bubble and the um, and, and this 2008 financial crisis, probably when we look back historically, we'll see it as uh, it'll be identified this period as the end of the American century, um, the end of the systemic cycle of accumulation centered on the United States. Now, the reason that I find these overlapping S-curves uh, visually helpful is because what's also becomes uh, clear here is that the crisis of the dominant regime uh, happens at the same time as an interstitial emergence of a new systemic cycle of accumulation. So if we were going to take 2A, 2B to be the signal terminal crisis of British world hegemony in the late 19th, early 20th century, it's also the period where you begin to see the uh, initial formation of the, what would characterize the U.S. century, and particularly the emergence of large multinational corporations, the shifting of the center of capital accumulation to the United States. Uh, Interestingly enough, and, and if I have time, I'll get back to it, the crisis of the Great Depression, but the crisis of the Great Depression itself led to a whole series of financial reforms that uh, brought out, um, that, that allowed for, um, formed the preconditions for the material expansion after, the global material expansion after the Second World War. So um, the, what I just want to get across here for now you know, is that from this perspective, we can see ourselves uh, not only at the end of the American century, but possibly um, we should be on the lookout for the uh, interstitial emergence of the new uh, characteristics of a uh, new systemic cycle of accumulation, if there is going to be one, and, there's, and that's, that's, a, that's a big if um, that I'll, uh, again, come back to with time. So 
So uh, what will this new systemic cycle of accumulation look like if there is going to be one? Um, let me go here. Now here, there's a lot, you'll see a lot of resonances between what Duncan was talking about uh, and this chart here, which Moisha didn't, didn't get a chance to see. So this is, um, so now I'm in the Schumpeterian 100-year short term, uh, which, go, which is essentially uh, the long 20th century. I've identified the same four crises as Duncan, one in the late 19th century, although our timing is a little bit different. But anyway, the 1870 to 1896 uh, Great Depression, so that until the 1930s Great Depression, when people talked about Great Depression, they meant that one. Um, the 30s, the 1930s Great Depression, the 70s, and, and the present. And um, what one of the key things that I'm trying to show in this chart is a pe essentially a pendulum swing between uh, crises where the underlying root cause is exploitation of labor that is uh, too low and, uh, and uh, exploitation of labor too high. Okay, so exploitation of labor too high under consumption crisis, exploitation of labor too low, a squeeze on profits, and obviously the too high, too low is not from the point of view of labor, it's from the point of view of uh, capital accumulation and profitability. Um, now, so on the one hand, there's a, a pendulum swing here between the root causes of the crisis, but also a pendulum swing between uh, the policies that uh, that brought about the policies and restructurings that brought about the solution to the crisis. So uh, from the uh, Great Depression of the 18, um, the late 19th century uh, is really the period of the takeoff of a major um, consolidation, centralization of capital. In fact, the, the crisis of uh, the, late, the squeeze on profits and the intensification, intensification of competition in the late 19th century was more related to the fact that uh, in cap, uh, competition among capitalists was very intense and that and the centralization of capital, what became to be called the emergence of monopoly capital uh, in that period, and the financial expansion, the growth of financialization in the period, um, brought about eventually a redistribution toward capital and um, the change in character of crisis by the 30s as a uh, under consumption crisis. Again, we get a, a swing back. Again, uh, the golden age of Keynesianism, Fordism is also on a global level, a global new deal um, that undergird the material expansion on a world scale. Uh, but by the 1970s, and this was related both um, to a strengthening of labor, but also a strengthening of, of the third world, the development, the development project. And we get um, the 1970s stagflation, uh, crisis of US power on a world scale, and then a switch back Reagan Thatcher counter revolution and gets us back to the present. So, if we were going to use this kind of uh, simple pendulum swing chart to think about the future, then we would say, oh, okay, the solution to this crisis is now a redistribution toward from capital to labor. Uh, and um, at one point, you know. It looked like after 2008 there might be movements in that direction, in the sense that with the election of Obama, with the, uh, I mean, Europe didn't, hadn't at, at that point showed signs of complete insanity, and uh, and at and at the same time there were uh, signs of growing labor strength, uh, growing power of labor in China and other uh, low-income countries, and so we had. Um, that seem to be possibly happening, but obviously that's not globally, um, or let's put it this way, that's not everywhere what's been happening since 2008. Um, now, there's an ambiguity in this chart, because is it about the United States? Is it about the world? Is it about the, cent the center? 
of uh, capital accumulation. Um, and I think that if we're thinking about um, systemic cycles of accumulation as something of historical capitalism on a global scale, then the only way that this can be useful is thinking about it also on a global scale and thinking more, not even so much on a global scale, but looking at uh, the emerging center of capital accumulation and what, what is happening there. So it's not what I would say, um, and I don't know how much I can go into it, but it's not a um, coincidence here that the initial crisis of UK and US hegemonies um, were solved temporarily by um, regressive kind of regressive policies on the redistribution of income, um, policies that, uh, that um, uh, increased inequalities, increased social instability, uh, but that that in itself then um, was essentially was a prelude. I mean, in Braudelian terms, what looked like a new spring for US hegemony was in fact the autumn and the prelude to winter. So uh, if we look, uh, and this is something, a point that uh, David was making, that if you look in, in China, there are some signs of a shift toward uh, a redistribution of, uh, of profits away from, toward labor, and it's partly the growing power of labor movements there, which is sort of another talk that I can't really get into here, but it's important and I can talk, to, I can talk about it in the discussion. Um, okay, but, and this gets me now back to uh, the second, back to, back to the long durée, because ultimately from here we can't uh, draw any firm conclusions. This is a chart on the evolutionary, evolutionary patterns of world capitalism. It was originally published, Giovanni and I did a piece in the, for the Review of International Studies in 2001, and then it's been reworked and for the postscript of the uh, second edition of the long 20th century. But it's summing up the evolutionary pattern changes over time uh, in world capitalism that can be seen across these systemic cycles of accumulation. And um, there's a few, and again, this hits, I mean, we keep hitting on uh, the, uh, David, Duncan, and I keep hitting on some of the same types of interrelated phenomena because here, again, moving back from the question of the economic foundations of the crisis to the political foundations of the crisis. So here, um, what we see over time is that the leading governmental organization, um, the hegemon organizing systemic cycles of accumulation becomes increasingly large and complex over time from uh, something slightly more than a city-state in the Genoese Iberian cycle to something a bit less uh, than a nation state in the Dutch cycle to something a bit more than a uh, nation state because you know Britain had a uh, global spanning empire in the British cycle to in uh, the US cycle, the US uh, had ambitions to form a world state uh, but never quite reached that point and before reaching that point, uh, part, well, partly because of the Cold War and partly so. So on the one hand, if we're looking, um, this is not, but I should emphasize, this is not meant to uh, be a deterministic model of the future. It's not that just because we can sum up the past in this way that uh, it necessarily means that the next place to go is world state. However, what we do know from the past, if we're going to con continue on a similar kind of pattern, that um, cap historical capitalism as we've known it has been characterized by um, organizing centers of increasing size and complexity. 
And where you go from the U.S. continental state, it's not clear. Again, the questions of, uh, ch of China in terms of the size of the market, China, U.S., various kinds of uh, allegiances, alliances. Um, the second part, and I'm just going to get to the far point out the far right column. So in terms of this increasing size and complexity in the process over time, all sorts of costs were internalized. Um, but if you look at throughout historical capitalism, one thing that was never internalized was the reproduction costs, costs of reproduction of labor and of nature. And in fact, the costs of reproduction of labor and of nature have been increasingly externalized over, over time, over the, the time of historical capitalism reaching uh, a major, um, almost pathological form of externalization under the US-centered uh, uh, cycle of accumulation. So uh, I think what this, this last uh, column points to and, and where I want to end is that if there's to be a new systemic cycle of accumulation of capitalism, or if there's really going to be um, a, a world uh, that moves beyond continuous crises. Um, so it may even look like a, a it may in, in the end be something we would call a post-capitalist uh, world, uh, that the problem of the externalization of reproduction costs has to be overcome. And specifically it means that more and more um, ca the and I guess maybe something Saskia is going to talk to talk about tomorrow. But increasingly, uh, the labor-saving, capital-intensive model that was at the center of uh, uh, has been at the center has to be replaced by a labor-absorbing type model of accumulation, or of or and I'm saying accumulation, but it also could be of um, reproduction of livelihood. And, this, and the second is that the resource wasteful, resource consuming model has to be um, replaced by a more uh, resource uh, conserving type of uh, model. And so then where, the question is where is that going to come from? Um, you know, if you look around the world in some ways you can despair at the thought of where the social forces for uh, a move toward this internalization of reproduction costs might come from toward a, in other words, another way to put this is, is that we need to move toward a model that uh, values um, the protection of human livelihood, including, and, and protection of the planet above profits. And uh, there, there are various places that might come from that I can't, um, go into here too much, but um, one, again, we can come back in, in discussion, is this question of really how to understand the difference, but what, what's happening in China and East Asia. The dominant tendency is to see it as a simple, that China is simply being incorporated into the expanded, uh, circuits of expanded reproduction of capital, but perhaps it's actually if we go in, and this is, was Giovanni Arrighi's point in Adam Smith in Beijing, that if you go in and look at the history of East Asia, and particularly the China-centered world system, that it has uh, different foundations, uh, including uh, more labor-absorbing, uh, labor resource-saving um, type model, and that the question is whether um, that can become, is becoming or can become uh, a new basis of an alternative uh, model. We talked, I was just came from Brazil where they had other thoughts about where alternatives may be coming from. Um, but just to sum up, I think that the fundamental problem now, we can, if we're talking about uh, not getting over in one place or another, not just the shifting of the crisis from lo one location to another, but something that would again look like a, a golden age of respect for livelihood, that uh, we can't go back um, to 
the Keynesian Fordism model, even if it's centered in China or centered in, in the global south, um, that we need to we need to be um, well looking for uh, not just in our own heads, but also in terms of evidence on the ground for fundamentally new forms of organization of, of livelihood and life. Thank you. written repeatedly on the structural crisis in the world system. Most recently... Microphone. Sorry. I have written repeatedly on the structural crisis in the world system, most recently in New Left Review this year. So I will just summarize my position without arguing it in detail. I shall state my position as a set of premises. Not everyone agrees with these premises which are my picture of where we've been and where we are at the present time. But on the basis of these premises, I propose to speak to the question, where do we go from here? So premise number one is that all systems from the astronomical universe to the smallest physical phenomena, and including, of course, historical social systems, have lives. They come into existence at some point, which needs to be explained. They have what might be called normal lives, the rules of which have to be explicated. And the functioning of these normal lives tends over time to move them far from equilibrium, at which point they enter a structural crisis and in due course cease to exist. Now the functioning of their normal lives has to be analyzed in terms of cyclical rhythms and secular trends. The cyclical rhythms are sets of systemic fluctuations, upturns and downturns, in which the system regularly returns to equilibrium. However, it is a moving equilibrium, since at the end of a downturn, the system never returns to exactly where it was at the beginning of the upturn. And this is because secular trends, which are slow, long-term uh, increases in some systemic characteristic, push the um, the curve slowly upward as measured by some percentage of that characteristic in the system. Repeatedly, the secular trends move the system too near the asymptotes, and the system is unable to continue its normal, regular, slow, upturn push. Thereupon, it begins to fluctuate wildly and repeatedly, leading to a bifurcation that is to a chaotic situation in which a stable equilibrium cannot be maintained. In such a chaotic situation, there are two quite divergent possibilities of recreating order out of chaos or a new stable system. And this period we may call the structural crisis of the system. And there is a system-wide battle for historical systems, a political battle, over which of two alternative possible uh, outcomes will be collectively chosen in some sense. Now, premise number two is the description of the most important characteristics of how the capitalist world economy has operated as a historical social system. The driving underlying objective of capitalists in, in a capitalist system is the endless accumulation of capital wherever and however this accumulation can be achieved. Since such accumulation requires the appropriation of surplus value, this drive, this drive precipitates the class struggle. Serious capital accumulation is only possible when one firm or a small group of firms has a quasi-monopoly of world economy-wide uh, production. Possession, possessing such a quasi-monopoly depends on the active support of one or more states. We call such quasi-monopolies leading industries, and they foster considerable forward and backward linkages. Over time, however, 
all such quasi-monopolies are self-liquidating since new producers attracted by the very high level of profit are able in one way or another to enter the market and reduce the degree of monopoly. Increased uh, competition reduces sales prices but also reduces the level of profit and therefore, and therefore the possibility of significant capital accumulation. We can call the relation of monopolized uh, to competitive productive activities a core periphery relationship. They are not places, they are a relationship. The existence of a quasi-monopoly permits the expansion of the world economy in terms of growth and permits as well trickle-down benefits to large sectors of the world system's populations. The exhaustion of the quasi-monopoly tends to a system-wide stagnation that reduces the interests of capitalists in accumulation through productive enterprises. Erstwhile leading industries shift location to zones with lower levels of lower costs of production, sacrificing increased tax transactions costs for increased production costs, notably wage costs. The countries to which the industries are relocated consider this, loca this relocation to constitute development but they are essentially the recipients of cast-off, erstwhile core-like operations. Meanwhile, unemployment grows in the zones from which the industries are relocated and former uh, trickle-down advantages are reversed, partially reversed. This cyclical process is often called Kondratiev long waves and Beverly's uh, illustration of the last hundred years are what I would call Kondratiev long waves and has in the past tended to last an average of 50 to 60 years for the entire cycle. Uh, such cycles have been occurring over the past 500 years. Uh, the systemic consequence is a, is a constant slow shift in the location of the zones that are most favored economically without, however, changing the proportion of zones that are so favored. Now, a second major cyclical rhythm of the capitalist world economy is that governing the interstate system. All states within the world system are theoretically sovereign, but actually highly constrained by the processes of the interstate system. Some states are, however, stronger than others, meaning they have greater control over internal fragmentation and outside intrusion. No state, nonetheless, is wholly sovereign. In a system of multiple states, there are rather long cycles in which one state manages to become, for a relatively brief time, the hegemonic power. And that was Beverly's Brodellian uh, chart. Uh, to be a hegemonic power is to, uh, um, is to achieve a quasi-monopoly of geopolitical power in which the state in question is able to impose its rules, its order on the system as a whole in ways that favor the maximization of accumulation of capital to enterprises located within its borders. Achieving the position of being the hegemonic power is not easy and has been done, has been truly achieved only three times in the 500 year long history of the modern world system. The United Provinces in the 17th century, the United Kingdom in the mid 19th century, and the United States in the mid 20th century. True hegemony has lasted on the average only 25 years. Like quasi-monopolies of leading industries, quasi-monopolies of geopolitical power are self-liquidating. Other states improve their economic and then their political and cultural position and become less willing to accept the so-called leadership of the erstwhile hegemonic power. <laughs> Premise number three is a reading of what has happened in the modern world system from 1945 to 2010 and is probably not too different from what you've already heard. I divide this into two periods, 1945 to circa 1970, circa 1970 to 2010. And once again, I summarize what I have argued at 
length previously. The period 45 to circa 1970 was one of great economic expansion in the world economy. Indeed, by far the most expansive Kondratiev A period in the history of the capitalist world economy. When the quasi-monopolies were breached, the world system entered a Kondratiev B downturn in which it still finds itself. Predictably, capitalists since the 1970s have shifted their focus from the production arena to the financial arena. The world system then entered the most extensive, continuous series of speculative bubbles in the history of the modern world system with the greatest level of multiple indebtednesses. The period 45 to circa 70 was also the period of full United States hegemony in the world system. Once the United States had made a deal with the only other militarily strong state, the Soviet Union, a deal rhetorically called Yalta, US hegemony was essentially unchallenged. But then, once the geopolitical quasi-monopoly was breached, the United States entered into a period of hegemonic decline, which was escalated from a slow decline into a precipitate one during the presidency of George W. Bush. U.S. hegemony was far more extensive and total than those of previous hegemonic powers, and its decline promises to be the swiftest and most total. There's one other element to put into the picture. The World Revolution of 1968, which occurred essentially between 66 and 70, and took place in all three major geopolitical zones of the world system of the time. The pan-European world, the so-called West, the socialist bloc, the so-called East, and the third world, which we sometimes call the South. There were two common elements to these local political uprisings. The first was the condemnation not only of U.S. hegemony, but also of Soviet so-called collusion with the United States. The second was the rejection not only of dominant centrist liberalism, but of the fact that the traditional anti-systemic movements, the old left, had essentially become avatars of centrist liberalism, as had indeed mainstream conservative uh, movements. While the actual uprisings of 68 did not last very long, there were two main consequences in the political ideological sphere. Centrist liberalism ended its long reign from 1848 to 1968 as the only legitimate ideological position and both the radical left and the conservative right resumed their roles as autonomous ideological contestants in the world system. The second consequence for the left was the end of the legitimacy of the old left's claim to be the prime national political actor on behalf of the left to which all other movements had to subordinate themselves. The so-called forgotten people, women, ethnic, racial, religious so-called minorities, so-called indigenous nations, persons of sexual alterity, as well as those concerned with ecological or peace issues, asserted their right to be considered prime actors on an equal basis with the historical subjects of the traditional anti-systemic movements. They rejected definitively the claim of the traditional movements to control their political activities. They were successful in this new demand. After 1968, the old left movements acceded to their political claim to equal current status for their demands in place of deferring these demands to a post-revolutionary future. Politically, what happened after 1968 is that the reinvigorated world right asserted itself more effectively in the succeeding 25 years than the more fragmented world left. The world right, led by the Reagan Republicans and the Thatcher Conservatives, transformed world discourse and political priorities. The buzzword globalization replaced the previous buzzword development. The so-called Washington Consensus preached privatization of state productive activities, reduction of state expenditures, 
opening of the frontiers to uncontrolled entry of commodities and capital, and the orientation to production for export. The prime objectives were to reverse all the gains of the lower strata during the Kondratiev A period. The world right sought to reduce all the major costs of production, to destroy the welfare state in all its versions, and to slow down the decline of U.S. power in the world system. Mrs. Thatcher coined the slogan, there is no alternative, or TINA. And to ensure that, in fact, there would be no alternative, the International Monetary Fund, backed by the U.S. Treasury, made as a condition of all financial assistance to countries with budgetary crises adherence to these conditions. These draconian tactics worked for about 20 years, bringing about the collapse of regimes led by the old left or the conversion of uh, the the conversion of left parties to adherence to the doctrine of the primacy of the market. And by the mid-1990s, but by the mid-1990s, there surfaced a significant degree of popular resistance to the Washington Consensus, whose three main moments were the neo-Zapatista uprising in Chiapas on January 1, 2004, the demonstrations at the Seattle meeting of the World Trade Organization in Seattle, which scuttled the attempt to enact worldwide uh, constraints on intellectual property rights, and the founding of the World Social Forum in Porto Alegre in 2001. The Asian debt crisis in 1997 and the collapse of the U.S. housing bubble in, in 2008 brought us to our current public discussion of the so-called financial crisis in the world system, which is in fact nothing but the next to last bubble in the cascading series of debt crises since the 1970s. Now premise number four is the description of what happens in a structural crisis, which the world system is in at the present time, has been in since at least the 1970s, and shall continue to be in until probably circa 2050. The primary characteristic of a structural crisis is chaos. Chaos is not a situation of totally random happenings. It is a situation of rapid and constant fluctuations in all the parameters of the historical system. This includes not only the world economy, the interstate system, and cultural ideological currents, but the availability of the resources, of life resources, climatic conditions, and pandemics. The constant and relatively rapid uh, shifts in immediate, in immediate conditions make even short-term calculations uh, highly problematic for the states, for enterprises, for social groups, and for households. The uncertainty makes producers very cautious about producing since it is far from certain that there are customers for their products, and this is a vicious circle. Since reduced production means reduced employment, which means lower customers, uh, fewer customers for producers. And this uncertainty is compounded by the rapid shifts in currency exchange rates. Market speculation is the best alternative for those who hold resources. But even speculation requires a level of short-term assurance that reduces risks to manageable proportions. As the degree of risk increases, speculation becomes more nearly a game of pure chance in which there are occasional big winners and mainly big losers. At the household level, the degree of uncertainty pushes popular opinion both to make demands for protection and protectionism, and to search for scapegoats, as well as true profiteers. Popular unrest determines the behavior of the political actors, putting them into so-called extremist positions. The rise of extremism, the center cannot hold, pushes both national and world political situations towards gridlock. There can be moments of respite for particular states or for the world system as a whole, but these moments can also be rapidly undone. One of the elements uh, undoing the respites are sharp rises in the costs of the basic inputs to both production and daily life, energy, food, water, breathable air. 
In addition, the funds to prevent or at least reduce the damage of climate change and pandemics are insufficient. Finally, the significant increases in the living standards of segments of the populations of the so-called BRIC countries and some others uh, actually compounds the problem of capital accumulation for capitalists by spreading out the surplus value and thus reducing the amounts available for the thin upper crust of the world's population. The development of the so-called emerging economies actually compounds the strains on existing world resources and thereby also compounds the problems for those countries of effective demand threatening their ability to maintain the economic growth of the last decade or, or two. All in all, it is not a pretty picture. <laughs> and brings us uh, to the political question, what can we do in this kind of situation? But first, who are the actors in the political battle? In a structural crisis, the only certainty, the only certainty is that the existing system, the capitalist world economy, cannot survive. What is impossible to know is what the successor system will be. One can envisage the battle as one between two groups that I have labeled the spirit of Davos and the spirit of Porto Alegre. The objective of the two groups the objective of the two groups is totally opposite. The proponents of the spirit of Davos want a different system, one that is non-capitalist but still retains three essential features of the present system, hierarchy, exploitation, and polarization. The proponents of the spirit of Porto Alegre want the kind of system that has never existed heretofore, one that is relatively democratic, and relatively egalitarian. I call these two positions spirits because there, is, there are no central organizations on either side of this struggle, and indeed the proponents inside each current are deeply divided as to their strategy. The protagonists of the spirit of Davos are divided between those who prefer the iron fist, seeking to crush opponents at all levels, and those who wish to co-opt the proponents of transformation by fake signs of progress such as green capitalism or poverty reduction. There is division as well among the proponents of the spirit of Davos. There are those who want a strategy and a reconstructed world that is horizontal and decentralized in its organization and insists on the rights of groups as well as of individuals as a permanent feature of a future world system. And there are those who are seeking once again to create a new international that is vertical in its structure and homogenizing in its long-term objective. Now, this is a confusing political position, picture, compounded by the fact that large parts of the political establishments and their reflections in the media, the punditry, and academia still insist on talking the language of a passing momentary difficulty in an essentially equilibrated capitalist system. This creates a fog within which it is difficult to debate the real issues. Yet, we must. I think it's important to distinguish between short-term political action, the short-term being the next three to five years at most, and medium-term action seeking to have the spirit of Porto Alegre prevail in the battle to choose the outcome of the bifurcation, the new order out of chaos that will be collectively chosen. In the short term, one consideration takes precedence over all others to minimize the pain. The chaotic fluctuations wreak enormous pain on weaker states, weaker groups, weaker households in all parts of the world system. The world's governments increasingly indebted, increasingly lacking financial resources, are constantly making choices of all kinds. The struggle to guarantee that the cuts 
to revenue allocation for least on the weakest and most on the strongest is a constant battle. It is a battle that in the short run it requires left forces always to choose the so-called lesser evil, however distasteful that is. Of course, one can always debate what the lesser evil is in a given situation, but there is never an alternative to that choice in the short run. Otherwise, one maximizes rather than minimizes the pain. The middle run option is the exact opposite. There is no halfway house between the spirit of Davos and the spirit of Porto Alegre. There are no compromises. Either we shall have a significantly better world system, one that is relatively democratic and relatively egalitarian, or we shall have one that is at least as bad and possibly quite worse. The strategy is to mobilize support everywhere, at every moment, in every way for this choice and I see a medley of tactics that might move in the right direction. The first is to place great emphasis on serious intellectual analysis, not in a discussion conducted merely by intellectuals, like here, but throughout the populations of the world. But it must be a discussion animated by a large openness of spirit among all those who are inspired, however they define it, by the spirit of Porto Alegre. Uh, this seems anodyne to recommend, but the fact is that there has never really been this in the past, and without it we cannot hope to proceed, much less to prevail. A second is to reject categorically the goal of economic growth and replace it with the goal of maximum democracy commodification, what the movements of indigenous nations in the Americas are calling buen vivir. This means not only resisting the increased th the, the increased drive to commodification of the last 30 years of education, health structures, of the body, of water and air, but decommodifying as well agricultural and industrial production. How this is done is not immediately obvious, and what it entails we shall only know by experimenting widely with it. A third is an effort to create local and regional self-sufficiencies, especially in the basic elements of life, such as food and shelter. The globalization we want is not a single, totally integrated division of labor, but an alter-globalization of multiple autonomies that interconnect uh, to seeking, uh, uh, in seeking to create a, what I call, universal universalism composed of the multiple universalisms that exist. We must undermine the provincial claims of particular universalisms to impose themselves on the rest of us. A fourth derives immediately from the importance of the autonomies. We must struggle immediately to end the existence of foreign military bases by anyone, anywhere, for any reason. The United States has the, wildest, uh, the widest collection of, of bases, but it is not the only state to have such bases. And, of course, the reduction of bases will also enable us to reduce the amount of the world's resources we spend on military machines, equipment, and personnel, and permit the allocation of these resources for better uses. The fifth tactic that goes along with local autonomies is the aggressive um, pursuit of ending the fundamental social inequalities of gender, race, ethnicity, religion, sexualities, and there are others. This is, not a, this is now a piety among the world left, but has it become a real priority for us? I don't think so. And of course, we cannot expect a better world system since circa 2050 if, in the interim, any of the three pending super calamities occurs, irrevocable climate change, vast pandemics, and nuclear war. Have I now created for you a naive list of non-realizable <coughs> tactics by the world left? 
the proponents of the spirit of Porto Alegre for the next 30 to 50 years? I do not really think so. The one encouraging feature about a systemic crisis is the degree to which it increases the viability of agency, of what we call free will in a normally functioning historical system. E even uh, in a normally functioning historical system, even great social effort is limited in its effects because of the efficacy of the pressures uh, to return to equilibrium. But when the system is far from equilibrium, every little input has great effect, and the totality of our inputs made every nanosecond in every nanospace can, can, not will, add up to enough to fill the balance, to tilt the balance of the collective choice of the, in the bifurcation. In any case, the constant intellectual discussion of the kind on which I have insisted would help us to rectify the aim should we make misjudgments or become sectarian or otherwise uh, shoot ourselves in the foot. Thank you. It's sometimes a mistake to write out your comments, but I've done so. Uh, it is impossible for me to do justice to the four papers we've just heard, each of which stands in for a great deal of important work. I simply hope to be able to point to some general themes, some of which are more implicit than explicit in the papers. First, let me point to some commonalities. <laughs> Do I get that announcement each time? <laughs> All of these papers agree that the current global crisis is not an anomaly, a temporary disturbance in what is normally a smoothly operating system tending toward equilibrium. Rather, crisis is endemic to capitalism. Relatedly, the approaches they present are fundamental historical. They focus on trying to make sense of capitalism's historical development, which cannot, as Duncan Foley argues, be attributed to the influence of any school of economic thought. All the papers regard the crisis as marking the end of America's hegemonic role in world capitalism. None of them, however, posit an identity between the United States and capitalism a posited identity that, to switch registers for a moment from the academic to the political, has been used as an ideology of legitimation for a wide variety of nationalist and fundamentalist movements. Finally, all the papers regard the current crisis as the culmination of global development since the 1970s, when a significant break occurred with the social, political, economic, and cultural order that characterized the decades following the Second World War. The changes since 1973 ushered in a period of instability and crisis in which organized labor was greatly weakened, the level of real wages in the advanced industrial world remained generally flat. Yet these crisis phenomena have not led to a resurgence of working class movements. On the contrary, Recent decades have seen the decline of classical labor movements and the rise of a wide range of new social movements, often characterized by the politics of identity, including movements of sexual politics and, in a very different way, nationalist movements and various forms of what are called religious fundamentalisms. Trying to come to grips with the large-scale transformations of the last three decades entails then addressing not only the long-term economic changes since the early 1970s, but also important changes in the character of social and cultural life. 
For Duncan Foley, capitalism's responses to the crisis of the 1970s were successful in the short run, but generated a new set of problems, the resolution of which is by no means evident. Capitalism, according to Foley, is marked by two different kinds of crisis tendencies. And there are many points here where I simply cannot go into detail. One is a result of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, driven, for example, by the upward pressure of wages. The other is a result of a rising rate of exploitation, which is tied to wage level stagnation. Both, both have occurred several times in the course of the past 120 years, which calls into question the notion within mainstream economics of a long run growth path. The crisis of the 1970s was due, according to Foley, with, uh, to the upward pressure of wages, which cut into profit rates. It was dealt with by structural changes, which focused on cost reduction rather than growth, entailing attempts to weaken labor organizations and relocate production to lower wage areas of the world. The responses to the 1970s, which according to Foley, was successful in generating large increases in surplus value, has in turn given rise to a new set of limits. In particular, it has generated a severe problem of aggregate demand. In addressing the current crisis with reference to this problem, Foley sketches a number of double binds. The ability of countries like China and Brazil to insulate themselves from the crisis has involved keeping the value of their currency low. This, however, would constrain any significant rise for, in workers' income, which would be necessary to address the problem globally of aggregate demand. On the other hand, precisely because precisely America's role as a hegemon has come back to haunt it. In 1944, the US rejected Keynes's suggestion for a truly independent global bank and instead took on the role of world banker. Although this has allowed the United States to run up a current accounts deficit impossible for other countries, it is the states now has generally lost control of its own currency. The American recovery has been undermined by the currency policies of other countries. The decline, and this is a minor note, but it's one that occurs in several of the papers. The decline of US hegemony is not simply an economic issue for Foley, but one pertaining to the global political order. He reminds us that one of the important functions of US hegemony after 1945 was to prevent the sort of enormously destructive wars among European countries then marked the first half of the 20th century as the saying went, NATO's function was not only to keep the Russians out but to keep the Germans down. In the absence of the creation of the World Bank proposed by Keynes, which fully admits is extremely unlikely, the problem of insufficient aggregate demand today could help generate potentially da dangerous rivalries. The outlook certainly is expressed in this paper is rather bleak. The crisis of capitalism and of US hegemony does not reveal a pathway clearly to another future, however necessary such a transformation might be. I do wish to note that as illuminating as Foley's treatment is of the crisis tendencies and double binds of capitalist development, the nature of the contradictions he outlines illuminate the limits of the existing order, but don't seem to point beyond it. I'm not trying to suggest that had he done so, this would have dispelled the bleakness of the picture he sketches. At issue is really not simply whether one can inject some optimism into the picture, but whether one is still able to formulate a critique of capitalism that points beyond itself to the possibility of a different organization of social life. I think this is a general issue that implicitly is raised by all the papers. David Harvey, like Duncan Foley, criticizes dominant economic theory for being unable to deal with the actual development of capitalism in the past 40 years and for only now beginning to consider the issue of systemic risk. Yet, as Harvey notes, the issue of systemic risk is at the heart of the Marxian theory with its focus on what it regards as the fundamental contradictions of capitalist accumulation. Accumulation is at the heart of capitalism, according to Harvey. 
In order to remain viable, it requires an ongoing average 3% rate of compound growth. This, however, is becoming increasingly difficult to maintain. Summing up a great deal of his work, Harvey argues that capitalism does not resolve its fundamental crises, but displaces them temporally and spatially in such a way that the solutions to one set of problems are generative of another set. Much of Harvey's paper describes contemporary conditions in the United States and Europe, where he argues neoliberal ways of dealing with crisis, for example, is indicated in the as emerged in the Mexican debt crisis of the early 1980s when the banks in New York were essentially bailed out and severe austerity was imposed on the Mexican population in order to cover the debt have come home to roost. I'd like to note as an aside, and it's only an aside, that although, at least in my view, Harvey's analysis is fundamentally structural, when discussing in this paper the ways in which growth since the 1970s has been effected at the cost of workers and of the system of social welfare, there is at times a tension, perhaps only rhetorical, between attributing this assault to the needs of capital or the wants of capitalists. A result of the structural shifts that were effected in the 1970s and 1980s, according to Harvey, is a bifurcation of the world today between a situation of deficits and austerity in North America and Europe and Keynesian expansionism in East Asia, which also benefits countries like Australia and to some degree Brazil that have become sources of raw material for China. Yet, according to Harvey, what is involved is not simply a matter of a shift in the global center of economic power. Even if China succeeds, the problems will not necessarily be resolved. The environmental costs could be terrible. Moreover, it will be increasingly difficult to maintain the 3% compound growth required for capitalism's existence. Harvey is also concerned with the possibility of growing interstate and block rivalries that is a return to a situation many thought had been left safely behind in the past. Yet although we seem to be approaching the limits of both American hegemony and the ability of capitalism to effect the 3% compound growth necessary for its existence, there is no coherent organized opposition. For Harvey, such opposition has been shattered in the past 40 years. Yet such opposition was always important not only for articulating a vision of a better society, but also as a condition for a well-functioning capitalism. The absence of such opposition is certainly not the cause for the dilemma of capitalism outlined by Harvey, but it does negatively impinge upon political discourse. This is particularly important, not only because much opposition today is in Kuwait, but also because so much of it has taken on a right-wing populist form. Although Emmanuel Wallerstein's approach deals primarily with large-scale cycles that have characterized the history of capitalism, his paper also addresses oppositional politics, both in the late 1960s and in the past decade. Capitalist development for Wallerstein consists in a series of 50 to 60-year Kondratiev long cycles of economic expansion and contraction driven by capitalism's underlying goal, the endless accumulation of capital. The shift from production to finance occurs as the expansionist phase of cycles end and the downturn begins. That is far from being a recent phenomenon, financialization is a recurrent feature of the long cycles. Let me say as an aside that rather than viewing capitalism as a subspecies of systems, I regard its systemic character as a feature that renders it unique and that requires a different kind of analysis than would be used for another form of social life. Wallerstein, as well as Silver's and Arrighi's approach, is characterized by the importance accorded states and organizations. So, for example, he claims that capital accumulation is only possible under quasi-monopoly conditions, and relatedly, the, that the modern state system has never been one of truly independent sovereign states, 
Rather, it has been structured by a succession of hegemons that impose their rules and order on the system as a whole. The post-war period, that is since 1945, according to Wallerstein, has been both a long economic cycle and a period of ascending and declining American hegemony. The period 1945 to 1970 was the most expansive Kondratiev period in the history of capitalism, followed by a long downturn. In discussing the end of the expansive phase, Wallerstein also adds a political dimension, what he calls the World Revolution of 1968, which erupted in all the major geographic zones of the world system. As he mentioned in his talk, two common elements were the condemnation of US hegemony as well as of the Soviet Union, and the rejection of dominant centrist liberalism on the one hand, and of the old left, both communist and social democratic on the other. This led to a sort of political vacuum filled by a reinvigorated world right on the one hand and a fragmented world left on the other. From the perspective of Wallerstein's paper, when Harvey points to the shattering of a coherent opposition in the period following 1970, he is referring to political movements that not only were weakened by state action and by economic restructuring, but which also came under attack during the revolt of the late 1960s. If I can jump ahead of myself for a moment, it seems to me that a historical analysis of the conditions of possibility for the critique of the old left and centrist liberalism, as well as of the failure of the newer oppositional movements to form a new coherent opposition, would be an important dimension of attempts to discuss the political dimension of the current situation. Such a discussion would attempt to mediate the sort of structural changes outlined in the papers on this panel and the sort of shift in political subjectivity to which Wallerstein refers. Such a discussion of subjectivity would also be important in considering further Wallerstein's description of the spirit of Davos and the spirit of Porto Alegre as two divergent paths available, particularly because it might shed light on a third path that exists. The crisis might be generative of discontent, but the ways in which discontent is understood and articulated does not necessarily point in the direction of the spirit of Porto Alegre. Another bottom-up spirit unfortunately exists, that of a xenophobic fundamentalist populism that also must be analyzed. The paper by Beverly Silver and the late Giovanni Arrighi ties cycles of capitalist development to those of hegemony. They present the history of modern capitalism as the history of the rise and fall of four hegemons. Each new cycle is shorter, each new hegemon is larger and more complex. In this account, Financialization plays a crucial role in the supersession of one hegemon by another. The upward trajectory of each hegemon is based on the expansion of production and trade. At a point in each cycle, a limit is reached as a result of the overaccumulation of capital. Another state then provides the outlet for this accumulated capital. Within this scheme, growing financialization entails transferring capital from the current hegemon to what becomes a rising new hegemon. Financialization today, then, is related to the decline of the United States and the rise of East Asia. However, according to Silver and Arrighi, this is by no means an unproblematic transition. In the first place, and I find it significant that this worry has also been expressed by Foley and Harvey, whose approaches are very different, they express concern that transitional periods during which a new hegemon has not yet clearly emerged have frequently been periods of widespread warfare and crises as in the first half of the 20th century. Moreover, it is unclear, according to Silver and Arrighi, whether China will succeed in acquiring the sort of global legitimacy required to become a new hegemon. Finally, a more fundamental problem facing this period of transition is that of ecological sustainability. All previous hegemonic cycles have been based on the externalization of the cost of the reproduction of labor and nature, 
This sort of material expansion cannot, however, continue. This position parallels Harvey's emphasis on growth and Foley's on aggregate demand. Capital has reached a limit that seems to be qualitatively different from its past self-generated limits. Silver and Arrighi conclude by saying that it is an open question whether what will emerge is another long century of historical capitalism or whether we've reached the end of historical capitalism. Yet it's unclear here what capitalism means. Is it sufficient to characterize it as a process of material expansion under the aegis of a hegemon? This, however, is underspecified in my view, which becomes clearer once one tries to consider a possible post-capitalist future. The main thrust of all of the papers has been to treat capitalism as a contradictory system that constantly generates its own limits. What characterizes the current crisis is that it probably marks the end of American hegemony and possibly the exhaustion of capitalism itself. Yet it is very unclear what, if anything, would constitute a post-capitalist future and what its historical conditions of possibility might be. The notion of contradiction, if one wishes to return to the Marxian corpus, purportedly not only elucidates the crisis-ridden character of capitalism, its limits, but also the historical emergence of a different organization of, socialism, of social life that capitalism constitutes as a historical possibility while structurally hindering its realization. This idea seemed conceptually unproblematic so long as the old left was the dominant form of opposition. The historical possibility generated by capitalism was generally understood to involve the abolition of private ownership and the market and the organization of industrial production now collectively owned by means of centralized rational planning. One aspect of the 1968 critique of the old left outlined by Wallerstein was it expressed a sense of the inadequacy of this vision based on a variety of critiques of bureaucratization, of abstract forms of universalism, as well as the industrial form of production itself. This, however, implied that the term capitalism had begun to lose its critical edge. It became easier for many to focus on the more concrete imperialism than the more concrete capitalism. Restoring that critical edge would have required rethinking the meaning of the term, which in turn would have been one condition for rethinking the meaning of post-capitalism. Such rethinking, should it gain widespread acceptance, could contribute to the constitution of a new coherent fundamental opposition. A contributing factor to the problems that have been outlined then has been a kind of conceptual helplessness in the face of the sorts of changes outlined in the papers, as well as the growing anachronism of much proletarian labor. In light of the multiple problems posed by the current crisis, many of which were presented with remarkable clarity and economy in the papers of this panel, and which indicate that conceptual work remains to be done, I'd like to strongly second Emmanuel Wallerstein's emphasis on the need for serious intellectual analysis animated by a large openness of spirit. Thank you. Uh, we still have about 45 minutes for uh, questions. Uh, so uh, those who have questions should proceed to the uh, microphone in the central aisle here. Yeah, okay. Is this on? No. Is it on now? Is it on? No. Uh, okay, who knows how to turn on the microphone? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. I wanted to address this to uh, Professor Altman. I guess it's on now. Whoa. Yeah. Yes, um, it's on. And to take up, I guess, uh, off of um, where uh, 
on this question of the post-capitalist society, and um, I know that you had outlined us to a certain degree this uh, horizontal conception of, of the social order, but um, you have spoken um, several times, and I know in a number of your writings, on a, a, a post-capitalist, you know, hierarchical, uh, exploitative, et cetera, society, uh, which would nonetheless be not capitalist. And so it's always been unclear to me how you would envision that and what sort of economy you would see that as uh, being um, part of. Well, I think we should the easiest way to answer that is who knows? Um, let me suggest to you, however, uh, it's perfectly possible uh, to have a, a system that's exploitative, pol uh, uh, hierarchical, and polarizing. Uh, that doesn't operate through anything that looks like a, a, a market system. Um, uh, we've had that in the past. Uh, there are other systems before capitalism that were exploitative and polarizing and uh, hierarchical and were not capitalist. Could you move the, uh, yeah. 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 Um, and that's one of the things that the people on that side of the political divide are no doubt arguing about. Uh, Moshe Postone, in his uh, remarks, said he thought there was a third path by which he was referring, I suppose, to the, uh, to the Sarah Palins of this world uh, and so forth. I, don't, I consider that uh, exactly a version uh, of the uh, of the Cheney um, alternative, which is uh, knock people over the head, use various kinds of uh, uh, sloganeering that will get you a mass uh, support of that, uh, uh, but I don't think it has to be capitalist, and I don't think they want it to be capitalist, or and they're not interested in that. They're interested in retaining their power. But the structural details of how this would operate is impossible to predict. I often say, I get this kind of question all the time, and I say to students uh, who raise this question, I say, suppose you were sitting around in 1500, somewhere in Western Europe, and you were saying, well, feudalism is at an end, and we're, we're moving into a capitalist world. What's it going to look like? Now, who in 1500 could possibly have predicted the uh, incredible pol structures that have evolved over the past 400, 500 years uh, that we now call uh, an ongoing capitalist system? Nobody could have um, because uh, they were developed as time went on. But the, the instinct that this doesn't work and we've got to find something else that will keep us on top is there. And I think that's what they're looking for. And as I said, there are two ways to do that. And one is to hit people over the head pretty hard, uh, which is uh, the Cheney approach. Uh, and the other is to, is to try to co-opt a lot of people. Um, I don't want to indicate whose approach that would be, but there are, there are a lot of people uh, uh, that are trying to create a kind of better world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but which won't, which won't cut into the hierarchy and the, and the polarization, basically. I don't know if that satisfies you, but that's the best I can do. Yeah. Uh, a number of uh, you uh, talked about that this isn't really a global crisis, but more of a crisis in Europe and the United States. But I wanted to look at the other half of that, which is the global recovery of the capitalist class. And as you mentioned, the, the profit rates going up. That seems to be very global uh, because of the transnational character of the capitalist class and their very deep integration and merger with uh, markets and production and uh, uh, throughout, throughout the world. So it seems one of the relationships that's driving the crisis uh, 
is this relationship between the transnational character of the American capitalist class and the national character of the working class. Uh, and this also relates to uh, the rise of a new hegemon, because uh, we're only thinking about the rise of a new hegemon in terms of a nation state. Uh, and it seems to me that it can be pro uh, possibly the rise of a transnational capitalist class that expresses their power through global institutions like the IMF and the uh, uh, WTO, and it, they use those institutions as governance to uh, regulate their competition and express their power. So I was wondering if you could just comment on that comments. Uh, I, you know, you know, capitalist class has always been uh, transnational, um, a large segment of it. Um, I'm not so sure that uh, you can look at it now as uh, being radically different from uh, the times when, you know, the Rothschilds were doing what they were doing and those kinds of things. So um, I don't think we're in an era where class formation is, uh, has shifted from you know, where, where it once was, which was always a national base, but with a lot of transnational links. But I think what you're talking about is something terribly important. Um, uh, during the crisis, the crisis is a moment of opportunity. And uh, it amazed me that uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, people like Soros and John Paulson and so on pulled in $3 billion a piece with their hedge funds management uh, in the midst of this crisis. And uh, last year, uh, the number of billionaires in India doubled. Um, and of course, uh, that was partly out of the transnational stuff, you know, given the way India is integrated, you know, with the call centers and all those sorts of things and the and, and, and emphasis and, and so on. Uh, but I, I can't see that somehow the transnational class is going to cut itself off from its embeddedness in the nation-state structures. It's going to use the IMF and it's going to use the International Bank of Settlements and all these kinds of things and to some degree try to use the WTO and all of that. Yeah, it's going to use those, those, those forms, but you know, even somebody like, like Murdoch, uh, you know, I mean, if, if there were not the US state, what would Murdoch do? <laughs> Uh, and, and of course Murdoch is embedded in Australian state and, and, and the US state and, 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 and the British state so yeah but they have, they, have rec they have done a lot of them have done very well out of this crisis no question about it there's been some internal restructuring within uh, the capitalist class over who has the better transnational connectivities than others I mean that's been always however one of the basic aspects of, trans, uh, of, of, of competition if I, if I have a better command over spatiality than you do, then I can generally defeat you in competition. Simple as that. And, and uh, we see, of course, uh, you know, General Motors makes more cars and more profits in China now than, you know, where do Walmart's profits come from? But, but that's been going on for, for rather a, a long time. But what we do see is the emergence of these factions, uh, which are very important. I mean, I, I think the kind of... Uh, the merchant capitalist faction. I mean, you look at IKEA, you look at uh, Walmart, you you look at uh, you know the models of Benetton and all the rest of it, and you start to see uh, power structures. And uh, Moishi mentioned something that I think is very important. I mean, I think there really is a tension between individual capitalists seeking or, or factions of capital seeking to construct the world in such a way that actually they're going to be maximally advantaged without any concern whatsoever for you know, trying to think of a politics that might bring the capitalist system back into some sort of equilibrium, even if I agree with Emmanuel, it's impossible to imagine uh, that really going forth. But in the past, they occasionally came together and did that. But right now, there's, there's a problem of capitalist consciousness uh, about the, their relationship to capital. And I see them basically feathering their own nests and actually constructing their own arcs if you like, uh, to, to hope to float off uh, above the rest of us while we cope with the deluge. Uh, and, and I think that's, that, that's the, the way I, I see it. But the, the other, just one other kind of comment, I, I talked about the global land grab. I think this is terribly important, what's going on. Uh, but uh, China, of course, is very active in Africa, uh, extremely active right now. 
And the power of the rentier class is beginning to emerge. Uh, I think uh, those who control intellectual property rights, those who control land, those who control resources. And I think it's very interesting to watch what individual capitalists are doing right now. Many of them are seeing their future as being best secured by actually acquiring land, resources, intellectual property rights, and turning themselves into a rentier class. So we may have to deal with the rentiers who didn't get euthanasized, as Keynes hoped. <laughs> Mm -hmm. just, just a comment, yeah. yeah. I, I think that, yeah, we can see that there's a, there's a tendency toward building up, returning to try and build up world state-type institutions, whether the IMF, the expansion of the G7, et cetera. But um, I think the question is whether um, these institutions uh, are going to be able to come to terms with a fundamental change in the balance of power between global north and global south, and what, and to the extent that they do, what kind of uh, change that means. So, for uh, I think one important thing I want to point out is that the systemic cycles of accumulation. Emmanuel tends to emphasize the uh, continuity within historical capitalism, but uh, there's also a major discontinuity from uh, hegemony, hegemony to hegemony in historical capitalism that, in many ways, makes the present parallel to uh, past transitions, so uh, capitalism without slavery is uh, very different than capitalism uh, with slavery. Capitalism without colonialism is very different than capitalism with colonialism, and uh, now uh, a capitalism that has been dominated for 500 years by the West and the North uh, is very different from what looks like is going to emerge even if there's a new systemic cycle. On the China, um, I think on the agency question, um, because this links up with the labor, I think that, and this follows on the point of the usefulness of analogies still between the past and the present, I don't, I think the openness is probably less um, than, I, I, I think that um, we still have to go down and look at balance of power between groups, between classes, and, and that the more we go down and look at changing balance of power between groups and classes, the more we can specify the likely paths that are open to the future. I don't think all paths are open to the future. The agency, um, it may be that there's in some ways more open for agency, but there's also this problem of unintended consequences. So labor, um, just a final point. On, on, on the question of labor agents and balance of power. Um, the shift, and I, I didn't have time to think, the shift toward uh, a tendency toward a redistribution, a change, the change in state policy in China, uh, emphasizing or favoring increases in wages, uh, the sympathetic reporting on a lot of the strikes that are going on. This is very much rooted in the uh, strengthening, the, the actual structural strengthening of labor and labor movements within China. So that as the center of manufacturing has moved to China, everywhere in the, you know, in the U.S. there tends to be, if we're rooting for a more equal and just world, that that's one pl important place to look. <coughs> Um, I was hoping to get Emmanuel Wallerstein and David Harvey in particular to comment about some of the really inspirational and exciting concrete struggles that have broken out across Europe and other places over the course of the last couple of months in particular. And, you know, the specifics of it, like 100,000 people demonstrating in Dublin and Ireland in resistance to a bailout that the EU is forcing Ireland to accept. You have general strikes all across the spring in Greece and looking like there's going to be more fight backs there. The general strike movement that happened in France, um, you know, the rise in China that was just spoken of, and also incredibly inspirational, and that I haven't seen much coverage of here in the U.S., is the general strike in Portugal, where some 40 to 50 percent of workers were actually on the streets in protest of things. And I think what students in particular have been following right now is in Britain, where uh, this is what I would especially like comment on, because in Britain, the fracturing and fragmenting of the left and demoralization was arguably even more profound than we have here in the United States, yet students fought back, are fighting back right now, and it doesn't seem like there's any particular organizing center that exists, yet it's you know, casting its net 
fairly widely, and um, the prospects here of that sort of a, uh, you know, a spontaneous outpouring, I think, are higher as a result of these struggles breaking out. So I'm curious what people think about that, and also to comment on the need for organizing it. What do we do now in terms of taking advantage and preparing our side for those sorts of fight backs here, whether it be directly within the labor movement, whether it be within student quarters, whether it be you know stuff like the LGBT movement that broke out. So I'm just hoping that people can comment on that and talk about what we as activists particularly can kind of do with it. Who'd like to take that one? Well, Emmanuel. <laughs> one of the things about popular uprisings is how unpredictable they are. Um, they occur uh, usually semi-spontaneously. Uh, sometimes they catch on and they have enormous effect. Sometimes they fritter out. Um, what I can say is we're in a situation where there's a lot of um, uh, potential f uh, what's the expression? There, there's a lot of uh, material that's incendiary all over the place, and, uh, and where it will light up and how it will light up, uh, I don't know. And how you should organize depends on where you are and, and what the local situation is. And I, I can't give a generic answer to that. I agree that there's a lot of popular resistance uh, to what the world right is trying to do at the, uh, at the moment. Uh, how effective it will be is something we'll have to see. But I mean, it's a plus. Uh, and the governments are afraid of it. There's no question in my mind that there is not a single government in the world, not a single one, that isn't afraid at the moment that things might break out and somehow, but of some group that might threaten uh, the maintenance of, of their regime. Uh, and I, I, I really make no exceptions to that, including the United States. David, yes. Can, can I just add to that? Um, yeah. uh, I think uh, the austerity, of course, uh, pits uh, the state against uh, the one redoubt of union power, which is the public sector unions, uh, many of whom have responded, of course, in Greece, Portugal, uh, France. Um, and, of course, it also pits uh, anybody who's affected by rising user fees, particularly tuition and, all, and universities and, thing, and services and things like that. So there is protest, but I, I have to say, uh, um, I mean, I was in France when a lot was going on there. I was in Britain when the student stuff was going on. Um, it's very hard to see the idea and the vision of an alternative within it. That it's that it's a protest against. Uh, it has not shaped a vision of what it's for, and so maybe that's something that that will change quickly. And I think uh, again, Emmanuel's right, kind of saying, well, until we have some vision of what it is we're for, then, and this is something that needs to be kind of uh, really discussed uh, and and debated. Uh, on, on the left, uh, and there are some people who go to these demonstrations, they just want to create a ruckus and that's it. And, and uh, you know, and I was delighted when they trashed the Conservative Party headquarters. <laughs> and, uh, but on the other hand, you also got to say, well, all right, where does it, where does it go uh, from, from here? So there is, uh, there is a moment uh, where the protests are, are, are shaping, but uh, one of the things that's not happened, it, it seems to me, is a, is a coherent kind of vision of, well, what kind of alternative is it that we're going to really strive for? Dear yes. My name is, is uh, my name is, my name is McCluskey, Deirdre McCluskey. And I, too, was pleased by the true trashing of the conservative party headquarters. I'm an economist. Um, I'm I'm not a mainstream economist, I think it's fair to say, but um, I, I have to perform here the role of the skunk at the picnic. <laughs> and because if we really are going to have this open discussion that Professor Wallerstein 
asks for. We can't just de demonize the right um, and, and, and forget that there are pe pe people who most, who most in this room would, would classify as being from the right who are sincerely interested in the welfare of the poor. Um, I am, for example. As an ex-communist, ex I, I think I can um, attest to that. What I'd like you all to, to, to answer is why you don't emphasize, as Marx and Engels did, in fact, in 1848, the tremendous productive power of capitalism. For the ancestors of everyone in this room, this conference would have been impossible. In 1800, world income per head was $3 a day. $3 a day in, in modern terms. It's now $30 a day on average, and it's over a hundred dollars a day in places like the United the U, 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 United uh, States. So, isn't it true? I ask the uh, 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 panel that in fact capitalism, for all its ups and downs, ups and downs that I I, I sure I, I sure you would agree also characterized the world before capitalism. Hasn't it been extremely productive for the working class? Isn't there, as the great Marxist economist Joan Robinson uh, said, a more or less hopeless contradiction between the first and third volume of capital? And haven't we in this room, every person in this room, been the beneficiary of this productive machine? And why, if it's worked so well for since 1800, why now should we expect it suddenly to have its last crisis? A sort of crisis that the left, and indeed some on the right, have been predicting ever since 1848. Duncan, you want to take this? Oh, yeah, I want to take that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, I, I, I think it's easy to exaggerate um, and to uh, cherry pick a little bit. Um, sure, average incomes go up a lot um, under capital accumulation in some broad sense of the word, but uh, it always does a lot of damage, collateral damage along the way to traditional modes of life, um, some of which people like pretty much um, and gave pretty high levels of some, some, um, some good things to, to people. Um, and I think the second point is I think about it from the point of view that you um, that you pose this question is that um, and this links with what uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein was saying sometimes capitalism is better aligned with larger social goals than other times um, and sometimes it's uh, it's coping its attempt to cope with its own problems creates more collateral damage and sometimes less collateral damage now I I personally don't think this is the ultimate crisis of capitalism, and, and I think it's a little premature to <laughs> leap to that level of discussion. But um, but Didn't I think we already have that in 1930. Well, yeah, we, um, <laughs> and in a way, you could argue that the capitalism that came out of the 1930s and the crisis of the Second World War, many people would have said, wasn't capitalism. I mean, what the European social democracy and what we have in the United States wasn't, in their view, what the essence of capitalism was. I think, it's, I think capitalism is something that's always evolving. It's always changing. Um, and uh, 
uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein put it very well about these bifurcations and which direction the bifurcations go seems to me the useful point uh, of focus for us rather than whether capitalism in some very broad sense is a good or bad thing. I mean, it just is. I mean, it's part of history. And maybe something else. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to take a little issue with or have a comment on Wallerstein's somewhat dis uh, offhand dismissal of the old left and his argument that the new social movements have replaced that as the kind of driving force for the left or for uh, transformation in the world. Um, the new social movements are undoubtedly important and are a factor, so I, I wouldn't quarrel with that, but the fact is that the neoliberalism of the last 40 years, the labor movement has been smashed, the organized uh, working class, not only the trade unions, but their political parties and their organizations have been pretty much smashed worldwide. And this is also the period when the left has retreated almost continuously. Uh, these two things have gone together, and uh, I don't see that this is now being reversed. The only maybe exception to this is that in Latin America there has been a revival of the left, but even people like Chavez and others who are, represent the revival of the left in Latin America say they're social democrats. They talk in terms of s traditional socialism in many ways. Uh, so that I think that it's really, uh, I'm not really convinced, and I don't think history is, shown that uh, we've now in a new period of the left in which the old organized working class is now irrelevant and, the, and somehow it's the, the social movements of the oppressed which are the uh, driving force. I didn't say in any way that the labor movement or the old social democratic parties, there are no communist parties anymore, really. I mean, the communist parties are social democratic parties. Uh, uh, are irrelevant. I never said that. I said that before 1968, social democratic parties, communist parties, and national liberation movements all insisted that they were the only relevant movement and that other movements had to be subordinate to them and other considerations had to be subordinate to their priorities. They were vertical and exclusivist. And they lost that in 68. They have not recovered that in any way. In fact, they've all given in. I mean, all these traditional movements which dismissed issues of gender, of sexuality, of, uh, 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 of race, and uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, now all included in their standard uh, repertoire of, 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 of what they say is a dramatic difference. If you pick up an issue of any of their newspapers of 1959 and pick up the same newspaper in 1999, you see an entirely different rhetoric. Now, it doesn't mean they're irrelevant. They're irrelevant. They're one of the movements. They are. And in fact, they are accepted as one of them. When you come to the World Social Forum, for example, the, the trade unions are there. The, the, the social democrats in one guise or another are all there, right? But they're not the only ones there, and they're not considered the primary movement. They're one movement among others, which are a whole series of movements. That's a dramatic structural change in, 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 in the world political scene. And from, from my point of view, it's a plus, not a minus. But I'm all for the trade unions. I'm all for, and uh, social democratic parties, I put that down in, uh, on the list of minimizing the pain. What, what, what they stand for, basically, at this point in time, is doing the same thing that the more conservative parties do, but do it a little less, and with a little, <laughs> <laughs> more of a safety, and I'm for it. I'm all for it. I'll vote for them any time rather than vote for a, a super right-wing party. But I don't expect them to transform the world. That's what I don't expect, and I don't think anybody else should. Hi, I wanted to raise a question which was touched upon a little bit earlier, but my question was whether or not any of you can comment on the history of the importance of the corporation, the uh, transnational corporation, in the history of capitalism and whether or not you see any changes in the conditions going forward that might affect 
the success or the way that that um, entity has worked. And I don't necessarily see any reason for that to change. Um, based on the discussion that we've had here today, the only hint that I got of that was really when we were talking about um, whether or not really another hegemon would rise and take the same you know, place as the US has taken. Um, so it seems to me that it might become relevant if there was a lot more rivalry between different entities or different um, states and, and we didn't have a hegemon in the way that we've had the US in the last um, time period. So if you could comment about that, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Is that for you? It might be. Yeah, no. Um, so I think that the question in part is, is asking whether uh, multinational corporations, the relationship between multinational corporations and the state, and uh, where, whether there's any prospect that multinational corporations are can be subordinated to state interests, for example, uh, in, in a way that uh, allows for um, a capitalism that's more um, socially oriented, socially protects social um, livelihood rights and other social rights. And um, I, here again, one place we're gonna have to watch is gonna be what happens in China, because it's still not entirely a done deal, uh, the result there. So the multinational corporations have, have gone in there as initially as joint ventures. Um, the, the Chinese state has more or less, certainly in the first 10, 20 years after the reforms, been able in many ways to subordinate um, the multinational corporations to um, power interests of the power interests and social interests of the um, of the of China, and the question is whether this um, relationship of exchange is going to completely turn upside down and the uh, capital po capitalist power um, control the state. So if we see, uh, there was an earlier question about the definition of capitalism and one possible definition of capitalism is a situation where um, state power is uh, subordinate to capital power. And um, in, if we look at uh, what's happening in China so far, because of social pressures from below, both from the peasantry and from the new working class, they haven't been able to completely commodify land. Land is, um, that there was a move toward commodifying land and the government had to back off because of social pressures from below. Um, the, the, there's a struggle going on, okay? And it's, um, and to the extent that, uh, I, I, that the, the, essentially a struggle going on that takes the form of a tension between legitimacy and profitability, which pushed uh, the move toward a global new deal in the 1950s and 60s, pushed in a movement uh, toward legitimacy. Now the question is whether all these struggles are again going to add up to something that pushes in a direction of subordinating capital to other kinds of social interests. So when, um, Emmanuel talked about the need to move toward decommodification. If we look at it historically, uh, we can also say that there have been periods over time, over, over, over the history of capitalism, where labor and other uh, fictitious commodities in the Palladian sense have been more commodified and periods where they've been less commodified. There's been swings towards commodification and toward decommodification. And all of these uh, swings in both directions were an outcome of power struggles on the ground um, at both class and geopolitical <coughs> struggles. And so that's, that's all I can say on it you know, for now. I just, I just wanted to say a, a tiny thing about hegemony. Mm -hmm. um, 
we tend to think as social science uh, scientists uh, of, of hegemony as structural, and that's certainly a part of it. Um, but um, actually, you can't be a hegemon just uh, by out of structure. You have to have a program. You have to have content. There has to be some substance to the hegemony um, because it's a political role, fundamentally. And that is an issue that I have difficulty in thinking about how, say, transnational corporations could organize themselves into some kind of hegemonic force. Uh, it's just hard for me to imagine. Hi. <clears throat> I want to address myself to the first three speakers. Uh, thank you very much for beautiful papers that were clarifying. Uh, I want to push you to consider what seems to me to be a deep <clears throat> and underlying analytic in each of your treatments, and that is reproduction. Uh, it's, it, it, it appeared like a specter over and over again. Social reproduction, the golden age of livelihood, uh, valuing the environment, uh, the capacity of humans to, to reproduce themselves. This seems like an ethical lodestar in your treatments. Um, and this ethical privileging of a reproductive sphere, which I think invariably ends up resembling the domestic, um, of course has some deep roots. Uh, I would argue that it, it ultimately harkens back to a certain idea of the oikos, which of course for Aristotle was the, the household that virtuously reproduced itself over and over again in contrast to the, the non-virtuous realm of the market. Um, and, uh, and of course we can think of Polanyi and the substantivists in, in a similar light. Uh, uh, but in each case, it seems to me that there's a thread of hope for the creation of a zone outside of capitalism. That is, the zone of reproduction is supposed to be, in some sense, at least potentially, an area where capitalism doesn't exist or can be resisted. And I would like to ask you to consider what seem to me to be two problems with this formulation. And the first is that, at least in my read of Marx, uh, production, the, the point of a Marxian theory is that production is always reproduction. That is, when we think that we are making new things, we are always making the same old thing over and over again. Or, more specifically, the fact of homogenized labor as it congeals at a particular historical moment generates a whole set of mentalities, dreams, uh, practices of living, kinds of household, forms of life in some that reproduce themselves over and over again. And so if we take reproduction or the possibility of social reproduction as our ethical goal, then we risk falling into the trap of being blinded to the ways in which production itself reproduces. Um, the second problem is a more concrete one, and that is that the oikos always has intellectually operated in order to, uh, to hide and obfuscate a set of hierarchies. Let's not forget that the reason that Aristotle liked the oikos so much was precisely that it allowed him to cover over the bondage of the vast majority of the population. And so I want to push you to, uh, to think about whether or to tell me whether this analytic reproduction is really the right one to use and whether it can offer us ethical guidance. Uh, it seems to me that what we need instead is an analysis of subjectivity, indeed possibly a rejection of life itself as an ultimate goal, and instead, in, in place of life as ethical goal, a practice of ethics or even a discipline of ethical practice that goes beyond simply valuing the domestic, simply valuing the sphere of life. In sum, I, I argue that a vision of equality is not the same thing as a vision of reproduction, and we have to choose. If we value equality, we may not be able to take reproduction as our goal. Okay, who, who would like to take that one on? <laughs> I'll, Duncan? I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, you know, it's partly Freudian, I think. Uh, we, 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 we have these very powerful and complicated feelings about our parents and about growing up and all that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, that's going to infect the way that you, uh, the rhetoric and the, the way that we talk about it. I guess I'm not willing to give up on life as a good thing <laughs> yet. Uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe more crisis may eventually push me to that. More, more, Wallersteinian chaos may eventually create uh, that um, mindset. Um, I think uh, I think you're on to something, which is, and it's certainly true in um, in mainstream economics, where where the dialectic between trying to look at the economy as a mode of reproduction or growth, say optimal growth models or socialist planning models, 
uh, comes to have this dual relation to the way it looked at capitalist um, economies, the market system, and commodification in, in, say, the socialist calculation debate, which had a huge, in my view, impact on the emergence of, uh, of mainstream neoclassical economics in the, post, in the post-war period. So I think that's well worth uh, keeping picking away at. And um, I don't know if you have to go as far as, as throwing out life altogether. All <laughs> yeah, let me have a, have a go. I mean, actually, I'm sitting here, and I'm, I have this fantasy that these angels are actually reading volume one of Capital. <laughs> That one is. He's reading volume three. Oh my God! What a what a uh, what a what a load of descent there must be in heaven with that. You know. Um, I th- I think the question you pose is very very important. For me, it's not an ethical question. I I, I mean, I'm not opposed to people who want to treat it as an ethical question, but for me. You know, I'm a historical geographical materialist and I'm just kind of looking at the historical geographical materialist necessities and requirements. And the dialectic is also very important, which is why I also say to students, you know, all of you who are into anti-poverty studies and all the rest of it, you should actually join us in anti-wealth studies. You can't, you can't deal with the question of global poverty without dealing with the question of accumulation of global wealth. And switch parties and then we'll go somewhere. <laughs> so, so there's that, but, but then I, I think this, this issue for me, uh, one of the things I do in teaching capital is to say, well, you've got to look at what Marx does, not the one-liners which are supposed to summarize, you know, all history is the history of class struggle, that kind of stuff. Um, and what I drew out in Enigma was uh, this idea that you have to embed the discussion of daily life and reproduction in daily life. You have to embed it uh, dialectically with other elements. And I use this footnote in Marx to sort of talk about, well, what's the relationship between that and the production sphere? What's the relationship between that and sort of the social relations, the dominant social relations which are organized and how are those three interrelated? How are those three interrelated with technological change? How are they interrelated? Uh, with uh, the relation to nature and institutional arrangements and mental conceptions of the world. So I, I use this sort of, uh, if you like, a kind of a interrelations between of those and then ask the question, how was capitalism constituted in 1970 across all of those dimensions? How was daily life related to, say, the relation to nature? And, and, you know, and, and, and what you see in the history of capitalism is perpetual dynamics of transformation across all of these. And if you look uh, closely at how Marx describes the transition from feudalism to capitalism, it required a movement across all of those elements. And so one of the things I try to do is to suggest that a political movement against capitalism has to move across all of those moments. If you choose one of them, like daily life as being the center, and that's the only thing you're interested in, then you you go badly wrong. Uh, you end up with a kind of Paul Hawkins kind of politics. If you decide the labor process is the only one, you go badly wrong, and I'll, you know, because you'll end up with the, auto- the, the autonomista kind of, uh, that's all that matters, kind of. Uh, if, you, if you say the relation to nature is all that matters, you'll end up with an environmental determinist kind of thing. So actually, the dialectic, uh, to me, uh, would say that as soon as you isolate this as an ethical kind of question, then actually you're going to lose the you're going to lose the plot. So to, to me, it's terribly important to embed it in this notion of a dialectical transformation. And the rise of socialism or communism or whatever out of capitalism is a movement across all of those dimensions. And therefore, we cannot, we cannot arrive there without changing our mental conceptions of the world. And we have to also change our relation to nature. We also have to change daily life. But you have to think of these as simultaneous movements and therefore as a what I call a, a co-evolutionary process, which has existed in the history of capitalism, and it's very well articulated in the history of capitalism, has to be turned into a co-revolutionary movement, and that therefore uh, the theory of revolution has to be, be transformed. And what we see a lot of the time is somebody pointing on this one and saying, this is all that matters, or that's all that matters. And, and, if it, and as I say, if it becomes therefore an ethical issue, whereas I think that, that right now, just to go back to this notion, I mean, uh, 
of the necessity of really thinking about this transformation right now. I mean, I'm far from being one of those people who decries uh, the history of capitalism. I think the history of capitalism has done wondrous things, uh, no question. It's created all kinds of opportunities. In fact, I even got a nice review of the enigma of capital in the Financial Times. I thought I had done something <laughs> terribly wrong by kind of saying, well, actually, I was deeply appreciative of, uh, of uh, what capitalism had done for the world. It's just that I thought, well, it got to a point where, it, and I agree, it's not a final crisis at all. Don't get me saying that. I think we are at an inflection point where we really do have to think coherently about alternatives. And in thinking about alternatives, we have to think about the way in which this aspect that you're talking about gets embedded in relationship to all, all of the others. So that's, if you like, the, the vision I would want to, want to use to, to, to think about uh, what a revolutionary movement would look like right now. Can I agree with David Harvey except for sentence one? This is not an ethical question. It's precisely an ethical question. Uh, it seems to me the issue is the following. Somebody suggests in X spot in the world that a dam be built. Okay, and the plus of the dam is A, B, C, and D, and you have to say, okay, let's discuss the plus of the dam and the minus of the dam, and you have to take into account the pluses and minuses that are very complex, and I'm not against dams per se. Sometimes dams are a good thing, sometimes dams are a bad thing, but only when you trace out all the consequences, immediate and long term, to people in the immediate area and in further areas and around the world uh, of, of, of this and make a collective decision on the basis of taking into account the, the, the multiple pluses and minuses of any particular activity, which is, seems to me an ethical issue, exactly an ethical issue, uh, can you make a rational, a substantively rational decision about that? And exactly what happens in, in our present system is that the people who decide to build the dam are only looking at what they outline as the pluses, and usually what they outline as the pluses are indeed correct, but they leave out all the collateral minuses, and they don't come to any kind of we don't come collectively to any kind of balanced decision about whether it's a, a, a long-term or a short-term or a medium-term overall plus or minus to build a particular dam. OK, was, one last question. Well, okay. Don? Actually, I had two very particular <laughs> Well, you can ask one of them. Let's uh, see, how can I put them together? <laughs> I had a throwaway provocative observation to end with, and that's not even a question. The question for Professor Harvey, please. Could you say a little bit more about the land grab in Africa? Who are the main players? What's behind it? And what are the consequences for indigenous African development? I'd also like Professor Wallerstein to comment on that as a, an ex-Africanist. And also <laughs> to have him say a couple words on the very uh, inspirational notions of centers of, of uh, local and regional uh, self-sufficiency and decommodification. And then the provocative throwaway observation, which you can talk about later, is uh, I, I noticed that the concept of human rights and the human rights movement did not figure in any of the discourse today, and I just wondered uh, not enough time, or that's an obsolete bourgeois shibboleth, or what? Okay, so I'm done. <laughs> David? More than one question. Yeah, the, the, I mean, uh, one of the things that's, uh, of course, happened with uh, China, particularly over the last uh, 15 years, is a, a, a desperate concern to secure access to raw materials from abroad. So you see a lot of uh, activity on their part, and they're very, very active in Africa, uh, procuring land or less, less in terms of procuring it directly, but very often tying in governments to, uh, you know, uh, to, to their uh, largesse. You know, we'll build, we'll build you a railroad provided, you know, whatever travels down the railroad comes to us kind of deal, you know. <laughs> 
uh, in uh, Latin America. I mean, um, you're actually dealing with a lot of wealthy, some, some wealthy individuals from the United States are uh, buying up land down in, down in Latin America as, as much as they can. Uh, agricultural resources uh, are becoming, I think, uh, increasingly uh, a, a target for that. Some corporations are certainly doing that. And then also, of course, the, the contract growing of soybeans and, and so on, again, often connected to the, to, to the China market. So, what you what you see is uh, actually a big big debate going on, which I'm not as familiar with as I should. Which is, what are the virtues of uh, a country allowing foreign ownership of land? And uh, the general model, which is laid out by the World Bank, is to say, well, if you want development, then you should open up your country to you know foreign ownership of land, and so you'll find a lot of the ex Soviet republics are doing precisely that. Uh, which is allowing foreign ownership of, uh, of, of land assets and you know in Georgia and all kinds of places like that so this is a this is a big kind of uh, thing that's going on worldwide and I'm not so sure um, I mean I, I, I've become aware of it very recently and I've not done myself the kind of real work that I think would need need to be done to look at it it's just that I'm very aware that this is going on and every time I turn up somewhere you find somebody is actually procuring this resource here and that resource there. And, and I think the same is going on in the field of intellectual property rights, uh, which is another sort of form of rentier uh, income. And, and when you start to look at genetic uh, materials and, you know, the relationship of the genetic, uh, uh, the attempt to put property rights over, over various life forms, uh, and what that means for those parts of the world which generated those life forms out of you know the kinds of activities there. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, activity in, in in that area too. So uh, for me, this seems to me to be one of the features of the present scene which hasn't been really highlighted. Uh, and it seemed to me important to try to highlight it here so that other people might take a much harder look at it than I've had time to do. I think you've conflated two issues. One is buying up land, and the other is who buys up the land. Buying up land is something that's been going on for at least 500 years. It's part of the, what capitalism is about. It's the commodification of land. Uh, as there have been more and more, there's been more and more capital, and there have been more and more people We've been trying to buy up more and more land. So more and more land is being commodified, and we're sort of in the last phase of, uh, of such land as has not been commodified up to now is in the process of being commodified almost everywhere in the world. So that, uh, that's, uh, and, uh, that's being protested and objected to by a lot of the people whose land is being bought up, uh, who think that land shouldn't be bought up and shouldn't be commodified. Okay, the second question is the arbitrary uh, national line. So if there's a country called Zambia, should only Zambian nationals be allowed to buy up land? Or can Chinese nationals, British nationals, and any other nationals buy up the land? And, and that, that's, uh, that's the issue of, of, of protectionism and so forth and so on. And um, uh, from the point of view of the person in Zambia, whose land is being bought up, it's not necessarily worse to have the Chinese buy it up than to have some Zambian national buy it up. That's one of the debates that's going on right now in Zimbabwe. I mean, you know, uh, uh, and in South Africa about who cares? Uh, I don't want the land bought up by anybody. And that's what the people in the, uh, the indig so-called indigenous population of the Americas are talking about and fighting against. And they're fighting against with the so-called left movements. So in Ecuador, there's an immense battle going on between the left government and the indigenous movements of various kinds, precisely about buying up land or developing their land, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I mean, yeah, the, one of the problems is, and of course, the expansion of the world's population means that you need more food, and you need more energy, and you need more everything. And so we're trying to commodify all of these things. And uh, you know, can we uh, 
and at a certain point if the population continues to expand we don't have enough water and we don't have enough uh, et cetera, even with technical improvements and so forth so that's part of the contradictions of the capitalist system at this point with with all all its pluses have brought us to this series of real uh, structural dilemmas of is there enough water in the world um, to uh, have everyone drink, and if not, who doesn't drink, uh, et cetera. I'm afraid we don't have time for any more questions. Um, I want to thank um, the, uh, all of the panelists, all the people who asked questions, and the audience for what I think has been an extraordinarily productive session. <laughs>